Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to The Hangup. I'm your host, Matt Dillahunty. Let me tell you, uh, I'm, I just, like three minutes ago, right before we went live, uh, just got a massive upset stomach. Uh, haven't even had a chance to go take any medication, but I'm here for a Wednesday. So if I have to duck out, it's okay. There's, there's other people here who can do stuff and we will try to have fun. You know, last week uh, I had the, uh, my producer, nobody you need to worry about, but I, I had her on the show and we talked a little bit about transphobic stuff. Um, and I mentioned at the outset of last week's show that it would be very nice if someone like Dawkins had used this opportunity to talk about climate change or something like that instead of trans issues. And there are, there's a bunch of science news items and I don't keep up with them the way I used to. I remember when I was a kid, um, it was uh, a, a, a different world where you didn't have the internet to, to feed you information. And so things were a little slower. And when you got your news about scientific uh, findings, they had already been through some academic rigor and the process of reporting on them was more matter of fact. Now it, it had its problems as well. Um, my era is why we started seeing commercials with people in lab coats because you're going to trust the person in the lab coat. And we built up a kind of, um, oh, what does science say? Trust the scientists. Here's what the scientists say. Science says this. And it was, you, you didn't have the opportunity for people to, to just say, nope, that's not true. Or I'm just going to reject science or I'm not going to, you know, accept these findings or whatever else. And that's all fine. But I mentioned some specific news items last week. Um, one of them was that there was a research group that announced that they had uh, produced room temperature semiconductors. And evidently in the week since that's happened or in the two weeks since that's happened, um, it seems to have been somewhat debunked. Um, hasn't been able to re been, be reproduced. There were people who were knocking the, the individuals who were reporting on this, saying they sounded like amateurs and things like that. I have no idea what the truth is with regard to room temperature semiconductors right now, but it appears that it's not a thing, or at least it's not as much of a thing as it as people thought it was two weeks ago. Then there was the Six Sigma event um, in with the Antarctic ice, which I put up a graph for last week. Um, because I'm lazy and haven't done anything else, I would imagine I probably still, yeah, I still have that exact same graph. Look, I can put this up. This is the... Daily standard deviations for Antarctic sea ice from 1989 through 2023. All of the blue and the grays represent all of the plotted um, variation for this particular uh, day of the year, which uh, this was a week or so or two weeks ago. And they plot out the median of all those at, at zero and then show how this one deviates by six standard deviations, uh, 6.4 actually. And that is a particularly terrifying prospect because this is the winter when that Antarctic sea ice is supposed to be refreezing and we don't know the full impact of what it's going to do. Um, I saw some, some reporting that we may have learned more uh, from this incident about how to pretend, how to potentially uh, combat climate change, but haven't heard much about it. Uh, I saw a news article today that Mars is spinning faster. I don't know what that means. And I feel like th that we have access to more information now than ever. We know more about reality than we ever have. Our scientific information now is better than it was 40 years ago when I was a, uh, a teenager. Really starting to get into to science then and yet we feel stupider to me watching people advocate for flat earth people denying the very vaccines that have helped prolong our lives people shouting down 
the medical knowledge and medical experts that allowed us to live longer and longer lives, longer than any time in history, unless you believe the Bible where it says Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. But, you know, if we're going to just stick with science, everything about today is better, except people don't seem to understand or value or appreciate or believe good scientific findings. We are probably killing off our planet and dooming us all to demise. We are engaged in battles that are important, but focus on human rights at the expense of how many rights are you going to have if everything in society collapses, if we don't come up with some sort of solution to potentially help with climate change. And I, I don't know what to do. I mean, the, the scientific methods that we teach, what, there is no the scientific method, but the general methods that we teach about, you know, observation and hypothesis building and, and then creating and testing models. And the key things that we've learned about making sure that, you know, a, a test a hypothesis needs to be testable, which means it also needs to be falsifiable, which means there needs to be some way in principle to show that it's not the case. You know, if you have an hypothesis that all swans are white, then it's falsified by finding a single black swan. And now your hypothesis, even if it's unsupported um, at the outset, is in principle falsifiable. We have lost some scientific rigor. I'm not saying we've lost the rigor in in the um, research process. But it, and maybe not even in the peer review, although it feels like that on occasion, but definitely in the reporting. We have more science popularizers now than ever, and we have great ones. Um, Dawkins did great work for many years popularizing and educating people on scientific things, both with his books and with TV shows. You've got Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, the science guy, who's basically a, an engineer, has done more for educating people on science than most of the actual scientists that I know. And you have a difference in culture, both with the access to information on the internet and with the rapid pace of the world that we live in. Because what's happening is we're on a 24 hour news cycle. We have to do everything we can to get the most clicks, to get the earliest clicks, to get people to click. And it's easy to bait people to engage and, and call out topics, but not on science. Science, of, of all the accusations of fake news, news about science is often the most fake. And I don't mean that the people who are reporting on science are, are wrong or they're intentionally doing it uh, a disservice. This is the process. You have to make your headlines sexy. You have to uh, make something that people want to click on. And saying Mars is spinning faster doesn't really do much. I mean, if we get almost no reporting on the Antarctic ice's Six Sigma deviation uh, from the mean, what hope do we have for any any science? I mean, this is something that would be huge. And I don't know enough ever on, let's say, any subject. But I thought it would be really good to bring in um, Forrest Valkai, also known as renegade science teacher, to come in and talk about Hello. science and wear a lab coat so that it sounds and looks as official as possible. And maybe we can figure out a little bit about what we need to do to do a better job of, I, I guess I'm going to just come up with the, the threefold solution right here. Number one, we need to do a better job of inspiring the next generation to care more about science. Um, number two, to inspire all generations to look for the best information and to develop the tools of, of figuring out how to discern between um, some crap information and good information. Because when you, when you look at this, it's what sells, diet stuff, exercise stuff, uh, erection pills or boner pills and hair replacement, but not the climate change stuff, not this other thing. And, and the third prong of this 
is getting science reporters to report on the science in a way that is both appealing and honest. And so now uh, I'll just sit back and Forrest can tell us how to fix all those things. Uh, so welcome. Yeah, it's e easy job. Easy job. No problem. Uh, yeah, no, the out. second I heard you, yeah, it'll be a quick show. Uh, the second I heard you say something about how we started putting scientists and lab coats on TV and all those things, I just immediately ran and grabbed one. Uh, too good to pass up. Yeah, there's there's a lot there with what you just said. And um, really, you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about popularizing science as opposed to popularizing media about science. Um, you know, we we can I can sit here and, and teach a really cool thing about evolution, but a way better headline is going to be like everything we knew about evolution is wrong or something like that yeah. because we discovered some new thing. Um, a recent one was when the James Webb uh, Space Telescope went up. Um, I was flooded with comments from people saying the James Webb ta Space Telescope, I can't say those words for some reason, just disproved the Big Bang. And here's all these scientists saying that like everything we thought about the Big Bang is wrong now. And you can look up their articles about this and like, there are actual quotes from actual astrophysicists who are looking at the first pictures and saying, I lie awake at night wondering if everything I've ever worked on was wrong. And what they're talking about is the galaxies that we saw looked a little bit different than we thought they were. They're, ju they're just slightly different. And we didn't think that was the case. And we learned a new thing today. And some of the models that we had now need to be tweaked. That's the quote. That's the, the this... thing we, we learned. It's a little bit different than we thought. And when you put that on the news, it's astrophysicists say everything we thought about astrophysics was wrong and the Big Bang has changed and all this stuff. And that's what sells newspapers. And that's what people do then come and, and scream at me. <laughs> are, are you talking about the same news story that I, I didn't pay much attention to, but um, where someone came out and suggested the universe may be twice as old as we once thought it yeah. was? Yeah, that's like 28 kind of billion nonsense. years. Yeah, because galaxy the, the the we we saw like these really really early galaxies and they were bigger than we thought they were or they should have been. They, they they apparently were able to develop faster than we thought possible. We weren't sure how. I'm not an astrophysicist nor any kind of physicist. They're working on that. They've got it figured out. Um, but like that news that like hey this is a little bit different and you might say like this looks like either the universe is older or our model needs to be tweaked all of the sudden now becomes this sensationalist piece about like, oh, well, everything we thought about the Big Bang is different and maybe it didn't even happen at all and maybe this and this and this, um, where you get people who don't know anything about science but do know how to write a catchy headline and get somebody to click on something. Those are the ones who take over the narrative. Um, you know, this happened just a little while ago on, on TikTok as well. There was a, uh, there's a site in Demonese, Georgia, where we find uh, Homo erectus fossils. They're some of the oldest Homo erectus fossils outside of Africa. They're around 1.8 million years old. Um, and it's a very important site. We've been studying it for decades. We found some of my favorite hominin fossils ever have come out of that site. And there was a discovery of a new uh, tooth there not too long ago. And here's a fun fact. Anything in the genus Homo can technically be called a human. So if I say humans evolved around 200,000 years ago in Africa, I could be I would be correct in saying that. If I said humans evolved around 2.6 million years ago, I would also be correct because that's when the genus Homo starts, right? And so when the bioanthropologists who discovered this thing were talking, they said, you know, this is an early human tooth. This is early Homo. This is a, a human tooth from outside of Africa from a million and a half year over a million and a half years ago. How cool is that? And I can't tell you how many people on TikTok took that and was like, everything we knew about human evolution is wrong. It, it turns out humans didn't evolve in Africa, didn't evolve 200,000 years ago. We're finding these old humans from, from and they mean us. And they're, they're saying as best that they understand what this scientist just said to try to be as excited as they are. That's not their fault. They just didn't know the thing. But let me tell you which video got millions and millions of views Versus the accurate <laughs> video that gets like 10,000 maybe. Um, and so like that's that's just how sensationalism works and that's how the internet works. And unfortunately, it's it's the the other edge of the sword 
where we have this amazing tool to spread information and to, to disseminate really cool scientific topics and a love of science, get people passionate about it, get them questioning and thinking and, and learning. It's an amazing tool at our fingertips to teach more people than ever before. But the other side of that is, as you said, there's more science communicators than ever, and not all of them are great, and not all of them are scientists, and not all of them have been to school to learn this stuff, and they just say whatever feels good and whatever gets clicks, and that sucks. Do you have a memory? I mean, you're here, you're working in science stuff all the time, you're a renegade science teacher. Um, at what point did science grab you? Do, do you even recall what it was that made you be like, science is what I'm going to do? <laughs> Man, uh, I remember like, as, as I, I can't tell you a particular time, um, but I, I just remember being like very, very young and like, like, you know, I wasn't even forest. I was just a shrub at the time. And I, I was just finding bugs and like just loving everything. And I, I loved Jeff Corwin and Steve Irwin really. And so like, I would go out and like catch neighborhood cats and toads and shit and teach about them to a camera that wasn't there and be like, look, this, this uh, frog, this I found is native to this area. Blah, 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 and like try to teach about it to just nobody. And like, that's all I wanted to do. The public education system beat the shit out of me and and made me think that I was too stupid. Um, and also I just, I have a different way of learning. And so if you had told me in like sixth grade that I'd be doing any of this, I would have called you crazy. But after I got out of high school and got into college and started meeting with people that could actually give me the information in the way that worked best for me, I was hooked all over again. And, and I felt like I was eight years old, just like creeping around my neighborhood, catching frogs. Only now I'm getting to creep around the library and the whole world and learn everything about everything. And it, it never stops being cool. I, I can't tell you a time since I like went back to university for the last time for that. Cause my first degrees were in education. Um, but like, since I started on the science path, like I can't tell you a time that I've been bored legitimately since then, yeah. because there's always something to learn, something to, even if I have nothing to do, I have something to think about. I have something to look around me and be like, oh, I wonder, you know, what kind of light waves are here and what kind of, you know, th thinking about like the nature of electromagnetic radiation, the nature of the fluid dynamics of the air around me, thinking about what's going on in my own body, the cells and, and what they're doing and what's happening, the different layers and like whether I'm making good choices with my diet or like, it's like there's so much there. Um, and like, that's, that's the wonderful beauty of it is that when you're doing science correctly, when you're learning it appropriately, every single time you answer a question, you're going to have two or three more questions come out of it. You'll yeah. never be satisfied. There's that old quote that the cure for boredom is curiosity, but there is no cure for curiosity. Um, and so, yeah, it just, man, I, I think people are naturally going to latch on to that curiosity. They're naturally going to be inclined to go and learn more stuff. We're curious creatures and you have a lot of bad actors out there that either make an argument from authority and say, I learned X, Y, Z thing, or I have this degree, therefore you should believe me, yeah. which is not always the case. Um, or they say that, you know, well, you know, the, the uh, science is wrong on this because it isn't comfortable for me. All right. I don't like it or whatever like that. Or they pretend like science is like just this tome of knowledge that has all the answers rather than a process and a discussion. Um, something that we're refining all the time. Like we talked about with uh, um, the James Webb Space, Space Telescope, and you know, we learn new stuff about the beginnings of the universe. That doesn't mean we completely throw out everything we know about the Big Bang. Similarly, you, know, you mentioned trans stuff. We've been learning new stuff about sex and gender for the past hundred years. That doesn't mean those things aren't important or that we throw them out. We just adapt to new information. Um, and on, uh, same thing with climate change that we we learned how that works and now that unfortunately this has become yet another politicized topic where you can tell whether or not you know by who somebody voted for and by who what what news stations they watch whether or not they believe that science is real about this thing versus that thing right. uh it's real weird <laughs> I'll tell you, i i'm i'm not a scientist uh i'm not formally educated in any science and yet my my passion for science ha has, it's really, I'm an obsessive learner. And mm -hmm. so there's something that I've had to learn all the way through. I spent most of today uh, sitting right here in this chair, working on a lecture on ball python morphology genetics. Now, I have no formal training in 
genetics. Um, and this is not going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to do it as a live stream. This is not going to be a slick production edited. It's going to be live. I'm probably not going to have much in the way of graphics, but really for me, I started because I've been studying this stuff forever and we've got a bunch of snakes that we're breeding. We're expecting, we, we have 12 babies so far. We're expecting more soon. And in addition to the, to the ball pythons, we're also breeding, uh, corn snake, house snake, womas, and crested geckos, and other stuff, and and even our rats. And so I started making a list, and it was like, all right, how do I want to do this, this talk? I, I want to do it from the standpoint of a breeder of, hey, what's going on? Why, why are we even doing this? Because here's a normal-looking wild-type uh, ball python that evolved over 70 million years or so, and it's gorgeous and it has quite a lot of uh pattern variation and a little bit of color variation so that no two normals really look the same just like no two people are going to look the same and then you compare that to something like uh, an albino which technically should just be called amelanistic but you, you compare it to that and there are there are hundreds of identified um ball python morphs define woma woma pythons an australian python aspidites ramsii um somebody in chat see i can't not no, talk about you. this stuff. and yeah, so it's, it's cool. like all right let me make a list of terms i need to be able to make sure people understand the difference between genotype and phenotype uh i need a good way of talking about the difference between heterozygosity and, and homozygosity and specifically uh, most of the genetic stuff we're going to be doing is going to be primarily Mendelian, but there's also a few polygenic uh, items there. We just found out that the desert ghost gene isn't a gene. It's two genes with a possible third gene uh, as a potential trigger, kind of like you'd have, like people for the longest time thought that, um, uh, was it, I thought that hair color was Mendelian. It turns out it's, it's polygenic as well, uh, maybe eyes too. And then be able to go through and talk about the difference between dominant, co-dominant, incomplete dominant genes, along with recessive and polygenic things. And then other items that we just have to line trait breed for or inbreed for because we can't identify the genetics that lead to it. I've got pages and pages and pages of notes here uh, all ready to do what's going to be an armchair. Here's how and why I'm breeding what I'm breeding. And all of this so that I can say, Here's all the snakes that I have. I just drew up a chart yesterday while I was sitting downstairs <laughs> for next year's breeding plan saying Here, this male can be paired with these four or in Mayfield's case, five uh, females, because that's where we get the most bang for our buck. Here's where we get to combine genes. Uh, here's how we work re multiple recessive traits into, and it becomes a 10 year plan because yeah. Uh, in, in ball pythons, and I'll stop after this, in ball pythons, um, it, it's about three years, uh, two and a half to three years before a, a newly born female is ready to breed. Um, we have an ultrasound, and so we're using that to test for follicle growth and everything else. A male can yeah. get up to breeding uh, weight in, in a year if you really push it. Um, and so it's, hey, if I'm building up my breeding colony do i focus on getting females with the genes that i'm looking forward to focus on getting males with the genes i'm working so i can you know work those off it's it's so much fun and every stinking day we're learning something new and not just about the genetics we're learning something new about the behaviors of different snakes um we have a, a number of different species here i can't i can't wait um pro, I, I don't know if i'll go live doing this tomorrow i think we're doing some some gaming stuff tomorrow um, but sometime in the next few days, I'll, I'll be doing that. I, I just don't understand people. And, and I'm, this is not a knock. You, you like mm. what you like. Yeah. You, you have a passion for whatever you have a passion, but I don't understand people. I have difficulty relating to them is probably what I should say, who aren't curious and who, who can look at scientific news coming out about anything and just say, I don't understand that. I don't care. And then go on about their life. I, yeah. It's not like you have to have a degree in this stuff to, to grasp it. I mean, I thought I came up, you and I talked about the, the Lego model for, for genes to, to describe alleles mm -hmm. and locuses and complexes. I came up uh, with another one today while I was sitting here, just because there happened to be a book sitting right next to me. It turns out other people have used it as well, where, and, and some people extended it to where you can have, you can look at, 
um, you know, like a city and then a library and then going to a book in the library. Uh, there's a book, Revelation Revealed, by Jack Van Empey. So it's Christian garbage that I'm going to be uh, debunking uh, here soon. But you could look at this if this was, let's say, let's say this was my genome all written down in book form. Mm -hmm. And you could look at it and say, okay, this page, we could call that a locus. And you're getting this side of the page from your mother and this side of the page from your father in a diploid. And so this one little sheet of paper here can either be the same on both sides, which means you're homozygous for that, or it's different on each side, which means you're heterozygous for each of them. There's lots of little quick and easy examples like that. You don't have to go get a degree and be brilliant to get the basics down because that page is an instruction in 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 my thing for how to do my eyebrow how to build my eyebrows we'll just say mm -hmm. and i got a little bit of that from my mom a little bit of that from my dad and because they seem to blend you know that that's an incomplete dominant whereas if it was co-dominant i'd have patches in my eyebrows and it, I, i'm just having so much fun coming up with ways to explain this and people's apathy towards science while living yeah at the most scientifically the advanced time ever just i mean it boggles my mind yeah carl sagan talked about that he said you know we live in a in an era that is increasingly dependent on science and technology in which less and less people understand science and technology um and like there's there's it, it's it's different than like when you have like you know some ellen degeneres bit where they're like oh kids these days can't write a check you know what i mean like that that kind of shit of course we're going to move on to the next thing but in terms of like just looking around you and asking the same questions and learning a little bit more all the time i don't get how anybody couldn't do that and i think it's important like you you're talking about snakes this whole time and getting like geeked up about about genetics I freaking love that because you were able to find something to attach that curiosity to. You know what I mean? You you found a mode for that. That's so important for so many people because if I were just to sit down, I guarantee if I were to sit down with you three or four years ago or whenever, before you started getting interested in this hobby of snakes, like if I had sat down with you and just tried to explain that shit to you, you would have hated it because it's just fucking dry, boring nonsense. And like for me... I genuinely love that stuff, but I couldn't give half a shit about computers. But if you tried to explain a computing system to me in biology terms, I would be excited about it now because that's, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's half the point of teaching is finding a way to explain this that someone's actually going to pick up on it. Um, a great way, you know, my, uh, my favorite thing to do whenever I learn something new is I immediately teach it in my head to myself in like four different ways. And I have an argument with myself about how do you know that? How do you know that? And how do you, and I try to you know, figure out like, okay, so how am I going to say this to a kindergartner? How am I going to say this to a middle schooler? How am I going right. to say this to a high schooler? How am I going to say this to a college student? How would I say this to my peers? How would I say this to some, you know, somebody above me? How would I say, and like, by thinking about it that way, not only do you learn it better, but also I fucking love education. And that's, that's, that's the point of it is I need to be able to express this in 15 different ways. Cause I guarantee in a class of kids, the the 15th way i say it that's when the last kid will get it somebody will take that long as i did as a kid i failed algebra one from sixth grade until almost the end of my first degree i failed algebra like pr probably over a dozen or two dozen times i took the class and failed it over and over and over i thought i was just bad at math I thought I was terrible at it because it was taught to me just as here's the formula, plug the numbers in. And, if, and when that you use this formula for this thing, and if that doesn't work, you go to this thing, you use this formula. And I didn't fucking know what any of that meant or why I should care. It was just numbers on a page. It didn't make logical sense to me. I couldn't do it. Um, and I struggled with algebra for so long. And then eventually, finally, at Tulsa Community College, there was a, a person who had a PhD in mathematics, and she was teaching a remedial algebra course. And I came to her after class, and I was like, listen, I want to be a scientist so fucking bad, but I suck at math. I don't think about the world this way. I think about it in like terms of processes and like putting a puzzle together. It's not just plugging in numbers. And everybody just keeps telling me to just plug in numbers, and I don't know why. Like, I, don't, I want the process. Yeah. I want to know what's happening. And she sat down with me for an hour and explained to me the derivations of where those formulas came from, 
Why is slope what it is? Well, let's talk about it. Let's actually put it on a graph and then say, all right, so X2 minus X1 over Y2 minus Y1, what does that actually mean? Where are those numbers going? Why is Y equals MX plus B what it is? You know, just like these basic things and showing me the numbers went here and they did that. Suddenly math was a language. It was a process to me. And yeah. from there, I went on to take extra math into like pre-calculus and calculus and statistics and shit that I didn't need because it's so cool now. And I've gone yes. back and like taught remedial math at high schools for like workshops and shit because it's awesome. And like, it's just, I had a different way of learning. My brain didn't work the way that they wanted it to. And that happens so often. So like, it kills me anytime if, if if you watching this ever think that you're bad at math or science, I promise you, if you have the time to say that, then you're clearly curious enough to be asking the questions and you're not getting the answers you want. Your brain just works differently. Find a better teacher. Find a better way to learn this stuff because you can. It's so cool and it's for everybody. And despite what people might tell you, science is not like this thing up on a high shelf that you need to like earn your right to learn and understand science is all around you all the time waiting for you to find it and the dictionary definition of a scientist is any person who is studying or has expert knowledge in any of the natural or physical sciences is studying or has expert knowledge the degrees that I've achieved don't make me a scientist. I have several science degrees, not a bit of them matter. I'm working on research at this moment, doesn't matter. I'm about to publish some shit, doesn't matter. What makes me a scientist and what makes you one too is if you're studying this shit and you're using the scientific method and you're taking it seriously and you're actually being passionately curious about the universe around you. If you question everything, assume nothing and follow the evidence no matter where it leads, you're a goddamn scientist and you should treat yourself like Rock one. On and that is my soapbox and for the day. I, yeah, I've had a passion for, I wanted to start breeding snakes back in the early to mid nineties. Uh, and so I had some interest in, in genetics, but a lot of it didn't really matter. I didn't need to know much because you don't have to know much about the genetics. You just know, Hey, I'm going to take this male and this female and pair them and I'm going to get something out of it. But yeah. being able to know what you're likely to get and what to, what to compare. And I have to go, when I, when I go to teach this, I'm going to be teaching, uh, about, um, gene complexes like for example the super stripe mm -hmm. complex which is which co consists of yellow belly spark specter uh asphalt and gravel and because all of these uh are allelic you can only ever have two of them and depending on which two you put together you can either get for example uh if you have two copies of yellow belly you get a super yellow belly which is an almost white snake or, or basically it's called an ivory but if you have mm -hmm. yellow belly and gravel um, that's a highway and yellow belly and asphalt is a freeway and they have completely different looks than any of them do in, individually. And it doesn't look as you'd expect for like an, an, an incomplete Dom merging or a co-dom this. Anyway, the point is if I, I, I just pulled up Wikipedia just for fun here, mm. let me teach you guys about alleles from Wikipedia An yep. allele modern formation from Greek is a variation of the same sequence of nucleotides at the same place on a long DNA molecule as described in leading textbooks on genetics and evolution. The word is short for allelomorph. The chromosomal or geno genomic location of a gene or any other gen genetic element is called a locus, and alternative DNA sequences at a locus are called alleles. If you are not prepared, none of that made any sense. If you've looked mm -hmm. into this at all, it's get back to the, to the page, basically at some level, all, all a chromosome is, is a bunch of genes uh, as part of a, a DNA sequence. And then the individual genes that are there are is a long stretch of DNA, not just one point of DNA, a long stretch of DNA that's located at a specific spot on the DNA strand. None of that matters because all you really need to know to get started is that you have genes, as do other living things, and variations in what we see are attributed to different versions of those genes and all an allele is is the name for a different version of a gene that would be at the same location and that's there, what there Wikipedia are some called. it's just difficult yeah there, there are some biologists out there as a, a friend of mine is he uh, teaches evolutionary biology at michigan state and i was talking to him about um the light of evolution series that i was writing before i published it and he brought up the point that like there are several of his colleagues that don't even use the word gene anymore because mm. allele is just the thing that like is because if i just say genes then like 
what the fuck did you actually say? Elil is a little bit more specific about like you're talking about which flavor of which type of which thing. And like, that's not to say that we should all change our language, but like, that's kind of just like the way that that particular group of scientists were going. Um, and that's the thing, man, is that like, that's, that's the nature of science. When you actually get into it, it's, it's a discussion and it's something that we're doing actively. You, we can agree on all the information and have a disagreement on how to interpret that information and what to do with that information. My favorite definition, you know, we, we talk about the word theory quite a bit, um, and, you know, that, that it's, it's not just a guess or a hypothesis or whatever. And, you know, I yeah. consider to explain what a theory actually is, but my favorite definition of the word theory came from Matthew Johnson, who's an archaeologist. And he said, a theory is putting facts in order. You have the facts depending on what order you put them in, you get a different story. You get a different picture. You know what I mean? And so like, that's why we have different competing ideas in upper level sciences. Germ theory, pretty solid. We got that. Evolutionary theory, pretty solid. We got that. Plate tectonics theory, pretty solid. We got that. But when you get really, really detailed into them, you'll find that there are theories within the theories and details that we're we're trying to figure out what's actually going on. And this makes a lot of sense here, but it doesn't make a lot of sense over there. So what are where's the bridge? Where's the connection? Is there one? Do we need to change? You know, like that's we we argue about how things evolved and why things evolved and where things evolved and by which mechanisms things evolved. Not if they evolved, just like all the details of evolution. Yeah. And it's the same thing in everything else. And so like that's that's just, man, it's such an exciting thing that'll get you thinking. And you'll find that there's arguments and feuds and drama in the sciences. And you'll find that there's people that freaking hate each other, not because they're bad people, but because they have a totally different worldview based on the same goddamn evidence. Um and like that's the coolest thing about it. So like, just I don't know, man. It, it, just, just if I, if anybody takes anything away from this today, I hope you remember: anybody can be a scientist. That doesn't mean you're a good one. Anybody can be a mechanic. A, a mechanic is a person who is studying or knows how to fix a car. If your mechanic tells you to put Cheerios in your gas tank to make your car run faster, they may yet still be a mechanic. They're just a bad mechanic. Uh, and, but so anybody can be a scientist if they want to be. They just have to start learning and start trying and go do the thing. It's a job, not a tattoo. Um, and also that that the universe is every bit as interesting and exciting at the upper levels of education as it is at the beginning of it. If you're doing it right, it doesn't get any less boring. It only gets more exciting, more fun. Um, yeah, I, I, there are so many things, not just scientific knowledge, but like personal things, things about me that develop me as a person, political ideologies. Like so, there's so many things that I have picked up, put down, leaned into, or cast away over the course of my education. There, the, Fucking, you've heard me rant about how much I hate capitalism. I wouldn't have said any of that shit before probably my fourth college degree because, like, that's when I started <laughs> learning this stuff was during my fifth. And, like, that's it just that's so when you much had paid cooler enough to be able to say that. This is bullshit, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that's that's when I was exposed to new ideas about that particular thing. And, like, that's the coolest thing about education is that th that's the point. It exposes you to new ideas. And the best part about bad ideas and bad worldviews and bad ideologies is that they are resolved by being exposed to good ones. If you get a bunch of new information, you can naturally weed the bad shit out. It's just, I don't know, man. That's, the, that's so, my whole thing. I, I got a, I got announcements to make, and then we're going to start taking calls. But one thing. Hey, we have a show, um, don't we? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I can get all this stuff over. So let, let me let me wrap up this thing here. By the way, um, one of my favorite definitions of evolution is change in allele frequency over time. But if you don't know what an allele is and you don't understand what that means, then that just sounds like blah 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 blah. And and all it means is the definition you know, sucks. You, by the way, it does suck. Yeah. But in any case. What it what it what it's talking about is alleles are different versions of genes, and so the wild type ball python allele is the one that is out there in the wild. But then there's an albino or an amelanistic one, um, and that's a different allele. And the wild type is incredibly frequent, and the albino one is not. And there's and evolution is about figuring out why that is the case, and it's because the natural selective pressures of an albino snake. Um, make it less likely to survive it's easier to see it's more uh sensitive to sunlight and these things live in africa under termite mounds and things like that 
Um, and so while it's probably not the best definition of, of evolution, if it's one you've heard and you're just like, I don't know what that means because I'm not keen on it, lose, all it is is it means how do populations change? Um, and, and and I see why it's it, it'll be par partially bad because it, it's focused a little bit on, on phenotypical stuff. Uh, yeah, well, there, there's the two issues that I have with it are, well, three, two. Two. The two issues I have with it is that number one, awesome. uh, evolution cares about pheno phenotype, not genotype. And we always talk about allele frequencies, which we fucking should. No problem there. But oftentimes students who hear that for the first time think that your DNA is the only thing determining your evolution. No, it's your expression of the DNA that's important. Um, and also it's the definition you said is over time. Time is it's successive generations. If one animal lives for a hundred years, it isn't evolving. It's it's how many generations in the hundred. You know what I mean? It's a lot so of like, scales of time, right? And so like, I, I, but again, that leads or to nearly. the misconception where people are like, "Well, my tomato plant hasn't produced watermelons yet, so it's not evolving." And it's like, no, that's not how that works. So yeah, like, that's how you get so crocodile. What what you said was a great definition for somebody who knows what they're talking about. But as an educator, I can tell you the problems with that definition from people that I have to, you know what I mean? So like the, the definition of evolution that I always give, the one that's in, in all my textbooks is any change in the heritable characteristics of a population over the course of multiple generations, which sounds way more fucking complex, right? But it's any change at all, doesn't have to be a good one, gets rid of orthogenesis. Any change in the heritable characteristics doesn't necessarily have to be strictly genetic, can be epigenetic, can be, you know, whatever. It's anything that's passed on paired offspring over the course of multiple generations, doesn't matter about the time scale, just the generation scale. So, like, that's the way that I use. Um, and I encourage everybody to try that one out for size and see if it feels good. But somebody in chat said I, I followed them on TikTok. And while it's not impossible, because I did launch TikTok just the other day, I've looked at TikTok once in the last six months, maybe. Uh, so you might have been followed by somebody else that's not me. Uh, real quick and announcements. First of all, yes. you guys are watching. What's that? I was going to say he only opens TikTok to watch my channel. That's true. Uh, no, you guys are you guys are watching the Hang Up. Uh, the, that's the Wednesday night show here on the line, and there are a number of other shows as well. Tomorrow at two p.m. Central, Katie and Arden will be on tomorrow's episode of Transatlantic Call In Show. If you have questions about trans rights, trans issues, you can call in there and get your answers. Also, if you're someone who's been accused of being transphobic and you don't understand why, or you'd like to defend yourself, um, they're willing to let you call in and and say things that. Um, to, to use the wrong language and make those mistakes and ask why and, and, and ask the awkward questions a little bit. I mean, there's, there's going to be a limit. But Katie and Arden, the, the OG transatlantic hosts, are going to be there tomorrow. Uh, Jimmy and I will be on the Sunday show at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Um, and, you know, any show I'm on has to be one of the worst ones on the network because on Monday uh, on Skep Talk, you're going to be back with Erica for like, are you guys going to do another six-hour show? Probably, probably yeah. knowing us. <laughs> I really, I'm already, I mean, I'm already on TikTok trying to get people excited because like I, I did a video a little while ago about like why other apes didn't also evolve into humans. And that got picked up by Christian TikTok. And I've got like a million comments on there like, this is all bullshit. This is all lies. It's so easily debunked. So I'm like, now's your chance. Call us. Yep. Let's talk. <laughs> Happens a lot. Next Tuesday, you've got Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock and special guest uh, Footless Joe. And next week, I'm going to have a new guest. Um, I, I, well, Arden just told me I'm. We we did already verify that, right? Uh, no, I I think we're waiting on. You're the one who has communication with him, so we have. You, I think we're waiting on you to verify that. DSS. Uh, okay. That then. Uh. Well. I, I thought I forwarded an email. So basically, I'm going to have to put my producer. Look, not right now. First of all, you guys go ahead and like and subscribe. Make sure that you've got the bell rang so that you get a notification for all these shows that are happening on the line network. Um, so I can't guarantee that this is going to happen next week. But if you go out to YouTube and you look for Mind Shift Skeptic, uh, fairly new YouTuber uh, doing content on religion and skepticism, I watched maybe five minutes of one of the videos and reached out immediately uh, to see if he had any interest in coming on the show. And he does. And so if you're not familiar, go look that up. And that's probably going to be my guest um, for next week. But we have callers. Uh, and oddly, we always give priorities uh, to theist callers. Um, 
and we have three of them. Hell yeah. So uh, if you're ready, they're coming after you. Hey, I'm excited about it. Let's do it. Sweet. Andrew in Florida is a theist pronouns or he, him wants to talk about uh, Kent Hovid debunking video on Forrest or something like that. Welcome, Andrew. You're on with Forrest and Matt. Hey, Andrew. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, Forrest. How are you? Awesome. Yeah, uh, I saw a video from a scientist debunking you. Um, or he made a video de- trying to debunk you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kent uh, Owens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he's a scientist, so that's why it's confusing. Uh, mm-hmm. He said uh, he, he said that the eye is too... It, he, he, said, you, he said you said that design, just because th- there's poor design, that proves that th- there's no God or something like that. And he said, just because yeah. it's a poor design doesn't mean it's not designed. God can make mm-hmm. a poor design. It's still a, des- a design still requires a designer. Um, and one more thing he said, I kind of wrote it down on my notes here. Oh, yeah, de- design demands mm-hmm. a designer. And he, he quoted Charles Darwin. He said, to suppose mm-hmm. that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Um he was quoting Charles Darwin there, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, uh, 1859, page 217. Yep. So I just want to hear I've read the book. That. Uh, so yeah. a couple of things there. Number one, yeah, Kent Ovind, uh, strictly speaking, can call himself a scientist the same way that literally anybody can. Um, doesn't mean that he's a good one. And that's, that's what I was talking about a little while ago. Kent Ovind uh, deliberately misrepresents science and and teaches it in a bad way in order to push his ideology of creationism, which isn't supported by evidence. Real science is backed by evidence. Real science demands skepticism. Kent Ovind preaches dogma, which is patently unscientific. So sure, he can call himself a scientist. He's a bad scientist. Um, the other thing here, if I can find, uh, there's a couple of things. Number one, I never said that bad design proves that there is no God. That would be a really dumb argument. Uh, I was responding to another creationist who was saying that, you know, their their body is so perfectly designed that that proves God. And I was just showing there's a lot of really stupid design choices in the human body that if we evolved make perfect sense. But if we were expertly designed by some grand designer, that would be a really dumb thing for that designer to do. Uh, I'm looking up. The last thing here, because I want to find, I, I can go get my copy of Origin of Species, but it's going to be a little bit of a walk to the other room and all that stuff. So I just want to find the actual, oh my glob, Origin of Species PDF. Let me see if I can just find a full copy online here. There we go. Um, and we can go through here and search for uh, absurd uh to the highest degree i believe is the actual word uh highest degree mm, i'm sorry i i i normally would have this right here possible highest degree oh my god he used this term quite a bit the well i guess i can find it eventually uh if do you have a copy of origin of species on you just out of curiosity, uh, I do not. I just got it from the from the video where he posted it up on the yeah. screenshotted it. Okay, I'm gonna look for just one second. I'm really sorry to waste your time. I just want to make sure I read this properly. So just give me one second, please. It's okay. I got the quote. Accuracy first. Well, I just want to make sure I have the the whole thing here in front of me because I just want to make sure I've got it. Um, Here we go. I got it. Perfect. Sorry about the wait. I, I apologize. I just want to make sure I had the actual text in front of me. So I wasn't just saying this. I could actually read it and you wouldn't just have to take my word for it. Um, so you're right. Darwin did write this. This To suppose that the eye, with all its imitable contrivances for adjusting the focus of different distances, for emitting different amounts of light, for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. The very next sentence in the book is, yet reason tells me that if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye, 
uh, uh, to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its possessor can be shown to exist, which they can be, by the way. If further, the eye does vary ever so slightly, and the variations can be inherited, which is certainly the case. And if any variation or modification in the organ would be ever useful to an animal under changing conditions of life, which is also true, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could have been formed by natural selection, though insuperable by our imagination, can hardly be considered real. So what Darwin said in The Origin of Species wasn't, I admit, it makes no sense to say that the eye evolved. What he said was, I understand that this sounds pretty freaking crazy. But if you really think about it, and if you look at the evidence in front of us, it hardly seems reasonable for you to say that this doesn't make any sense. That's the actual quote. He was being intellectually honest and saying, here's a potential problem with my theory that people might point out, and here's the solution which actually comports with reality. And this is more it's demonstration what I said at the beginning. This is why Kent Hovind is a bad scientist. If he had actually read the damn book or even just the next sentence of the book, he would have seen that that isn't at all what Darwin was talking about. And what Darwin said stands up to reason today. Darwin got some stuff wrong. There was a lot that he didn't know. His book was 200 years old now. We've learned a lot since then. This was one of the things that he got very right. And for Kent Hovind to sit here and say that I'm not right, that I'm a bad scientist, that I don't know something about the universe because somebody in a 200 year old book said something that he agrees with that was only half of a quote. That's just being patently dishonest. That's, that's what we call lying in the biological world. So there's my answer to that. Uh, I haven't made many uh, responses to Kent Hovind's video, um, mainly because I don't want to give him too much screen time. Uh, and also because I genuinely have a hard time caring what he thinks of me. I have a rule that I don't take advice from anybody that I wouldn't also take criticism from. So like, I just, I don't know, or, or vice versa. I don't take criticism from anybody that I wouldn't take advice from. I certainly would not take either advice or criticism from him. So like, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Do you have another one? Um, He's like the creationist guru. Uh, so, yeah. No, no. no. Well, I would disagree. There, there are better creationists, and that's saying yeah. something. Creationism isn't even a theory. Uh, it's it's just, it's it's a really, really bad attempt at explaining the natural world. Uh, Kent Hovind doesn't, uh, there's a reason why so many other creationist organizations denounce him. Like Answers in Genesis, which is a big creationist organization that says a lot of really dumb and unprovable and unscientific shit, they don't even want to associate with the dude. So, like, yeah, I don't the know. Interesting man. Thing to me, the interesting thing to me with, with somebody like Kent Hovind is uh, Dr. Dino. Um, for e each of the creationists, and much this happens in the scientific community. You talked about it a little bit before. People do different views with the same evidence, freaking hate each other. So, there's different creationists who are going to um, address. Uh, each other in a way where, oh, no, no we're not going to go with the, you know, the Glen Rose tracks and we're, Kent Hovind's not good and Ken Ham's not good and Answers in Genesis is great, but something else isn't good. You know, they do that all the time. But here's all, I mean, Forrest already addressed this. The quote from Darwin that Kent Hovind's using is essentially has the intent of conveying the opposite message from the one Kent Hovind would like it to convey. It's like saying, I know this sounds crazy, but here's this, this, this is. And he's only quoting the part that says, I know this sounds crazy. That's, that's what the whole thing is. But here's one other thing to walk away with remembering, and that is it doesn't matter what Darwin said at all. Darwin nope. could have said, I've spent my years trying to prove evolution, and it turned out to be false and garbage and nonsense. And that wouldn't make it garbage. We don't accept evolution because it's from Darwin. We accept it because of the evidence for this. And when the creationists decide to try to quote biologists in commentary instead of pointing to or addressing the actual evidence, that should be a big red flag. People want to know, how do you do what you do, Matt, when you're calling in? How do you guys, you know, address these things? Because I'm constantly thinking, if someone were going to poke holes in this, 
what would they say and what would they avoid saying? And the second Kent Hovind pulls up that partial quote from Darwin um, instead of actual scientific evidence for creationism. When all he does is mock or, or, or quotes like that, that's what lets you know you're not talking to someone who is seriously doing good scientific work. All right, so he sounds like a whack job. Thank you, gentlemen. Cool. Well, hold on really Thanks, quickly Andrew. before you go. I just want to like make sure that we're all on the same page here. Do you understand now why what he said is bad? Like, or do you think that we just sit here and talk shit about your favorite no, guy? He just, like, he's not, he's not my favorite guy. <laughs> okay. Just, okay. I just want to make sure. Scientist, so it was confusing. No, he's not my favorite guy. <laughs> and no, no. Okay. He, yeah. He misquoted. It was, it was dishonest. No, I, I, I agree. And, it makes sense. Cool. Thank okay. You yeah. I just want to make sure because we, we get a lot of people who call in and they'll say like, oh, well, Kent Hovind said this. And we're like, who gives a shit? And they're like, well, I'm going to go tell him. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're we're up to date. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not like that yeah, at all. If somebody, if somebody wants, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. Um, thanks so much, sir. If somebody wants to go tell Kent Hovind um, that I just said he was a shitty scientist who lies by misquoting Darwin about something that he's completely wrong about and that wouldn't matter even if he was right, go right ahead. I wouldn't have any issue with that either. It's, it like, and that's the thing. It's like it's 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 so fucking. It's demonst. It, it it shows where his line of thinking is. Well, I can see your 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 Messiah here, this Darwin guy. I can make him say something bad. Right. Like, why would that matter? Even if that were true, to, to to even say that shows that you're coming from this weird dogmatic place that makes no fucking sense. It's it's why yep. I struggle so hard when you know when I'm talking about evolution or when I'm talking about this, when you come up against someone who, you know, has, is trapped in that dogmatic thinking, they genuinely can't understand that you looked at the evidence and came up with a different idea. It's like, well, my God said this, the person I worship said this. So if you say something different, then who did you worship to tell you to say something different than me? It's like nobody, I promise yeah. nobody. <laughs> it it it's, comes it's up a, a lot time, in the, man. It comes up a lot in the in the debating thing where I have opponents who spend more time preparing for me than for the subject, and it shows every yeah. time. Um, but yeah, we got more callers. There was this really cool. With, uh, I, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, I've got Gary in Pennsylvania. Pronouns are he him. Uh, Gary is a theist who doesn't uh, believe evolution. So welcome, Gary. You're on with Forrest. Hello. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hey. Hello. I love science. And I really want to hear this, this uh, uh, answer from you. Um, Righteous, I, yeah. Let's do it. Is, not, is, not is it possible you could speak up a bit or adjust your microphone? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Is it, is it better now? Is it better now? A little yes. bit. So, so my question is this. Uh, first of all, some of those people that you mentioned, the Hogan guy and, and many others, they don't even truly understand their own Bible interpretation not that i'm knocking them it's just that they're part of a church organization and so they're stuck in tradition as opposed to you know studying on their own so they're just cookie cutter answers um and all churches are dead by the way all of them but um, i'm, where, where I'm really going? confused I, i'm really confused because it, you know you're, you're calling in to talk about evolution but but instead you're saying that kent hovind is essentially trapped in a church and all churches are dead well I don't know that that's true, um, nor does it matter. That's a whole other discussion. Gotcha. I thought you'd agree with that, but anyways. Um, I, I have no idea what you mean by it, but it's, it's, I would love to talk gotcha. about evolution, though. I don't think sure. Kent Hovind is trapped in a particular church. I think Kent Hovind is a church unto himself. Gotcha. So in terms of DNA continually mutating over time, mm. DNA continually mutates. So the term evolution is a natural process. So my question is, I'm a creationist, but when yeah. someone says they believe in evolution, evolution is natural part of the creation process. So how, how do I figure this out? I, I don't understand what question you're asking me. Are you, are you saying that you believe that evolution is a part of the way that the creator made life the way that it is today? And therefore, both evolution and creationism are true at the same time? Or, or are you saying that they're incompatible? I don't understand what you mean. I, I, from my understanding, DNA continually mutates. So in order, in order to prove 
creationism, which you're looking for evidence, if, if I believe in creation and someone tells me, look at the mutations in DNA to prove that evolution is true, DNA naturally mutates. So how does somebody right. prove to me something that, that continually happens? That's why I think for, for me personally as a creationist, I cannot espouse evolution because I believe in evolution. Does that make sense? No, but I can try to help. So were, were, were you listening to the beginning of the show where Matt and I were geeking out about biology for a long time? I missed that. Please go ahead. Okay. No, that's totally fine. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't repeating myself if I didn't have to. So the actual definition of evolution is any change in the heritable characteristics of a population over the course of multiple generations. So you're right. DNA does constantly mutate. Pretty much every time it's replicated, we have mutations. The, you know, the, the way that we learned it in school is there's an average of about one mutation per 100,000 letters copied or something like that. There's, there's variation. But like the point is, every single time DNA is replicated, every time your cells divide, there's some sort of mutation. That has nothing to do with evolution. The mutations in your germ cells, in your sperm and egg cells, that are passed on to offspring, that has to do with evolution because now you have offspring that are genetically unique, that are distinct from their parents. So take you know uh, multiple parents out of it. Let's just talk about clonal evolution. Talk about just something that, that reproduces um, asexually, like a bacteria or something. So you don't have to worry about alleles and all that, that jazz. So you have this bacteria has its DNA. It makes a copy of its DNA. That copy has some changes to it. And then that DNA... Pfft, poops out into a new, whole new bacterial organism. So now you have two bacteria, one parent, one child, and the child has slightly different DNA than the parent. That process, that's the mutation that we're talking about in evolution. So over the course of successive generations, after you know generation after generation after generation, child, 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 the great, 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 10,000 times great grandchild is going to have significantly different DNA than the original, right? And evolution is just talking about that change over the course of multiple generations, whether it be good or bad, whatever. When we talk about evolution in terms of natural selection, we're talking about do those changes make that child more likely to survive and more importantly, reproduce as well. Because there's plenty of mutations that make it less likely that you survive, but more likely that you reproduce. And because you're reproducing and passing on those mutations, those are the mutations that will be selected for. Those are the mutations that actually give you fitness in your environment. So that's what actual evolution is, and that's what we're talking about. And that is something that is, not only do we have a huge amount of evidence for it, but also it's like plainly observable both in the laboratory out in the, and out in the field. We can see it with our own eyes. Great answer, and, and I agree with you, but my problem is if my great-great-grandfather had a small wiener, and I have a small mm. wiener, and we're mm. talking about evolution over a period of time, the only thing that I see is raccoons going in my trash, roaches coming in my house. Uh, I muted the caller because that sounds like troll nonsense to me. You guys can yeah. decide what you want to do with that. He's muted on so, my yeah, end, well, so I need an okay to unmute. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm willing to give him a second. Gary? Thank Thanks. Uh, yes, please go ahead. I don't know what kind of individual calls in as a theist, gets an explanation for evolution, and then starts talking about wiener size and raccoons. So if you're just calling in to troll and have fun, we can move on. Um, or would you like to actually hit a relevant point i'm sorry this is just my method of communication i'm just talking to you like i would a friend or so, so i didn't mean to to sound like i'm trolling i'm just i'm just a kind of a that's just the way i communicate i i just well, I, i'm confused because on a molecular I'm confused, level i see i'm confused i don't see it on a on a physical eye test like okay no no i'm saying here's the thing Here, here's the thing um it seems like now you've slipped into suggesting that you can see evolution at a micro level but not a macro level but the only diff there is no there is no division like that in science. Um, little changes add up. Well said. Well, well, thanks. I I, I don't think I'm going to get my answer, but you guys. Yeah, I don't think you're. Good. I don't think you're worth talking to. Thank you so much.
Uh, he called in previously, refused to give pronouns, wanted to know why there was so much division in the world, and now is talking about wieners, and I want to talk to you like you're a friend. Call in right. and talk seriously to my guest who just gave you an explanation that you just accepted, and then you're like, oh, I agree with all that, but I, I don't, I'm not even convinced you listened or understood it. So, what I, what I don't get is he said at the very end, I don't think I'm going to get an answer. I don't think he asked a question. He, yeah, like we didn't, we didn't get anywhere. What, what it's, happened? <laughs> it's really bizarre. All right. Well, I've got, a, I've got another theist calling in, but with a, a question unrelated to science that uh, maybe I'll have hey. something to add here on. Jerry in Dallas, pronouncer he, him, has a question about bodily autonomy from the father's perspective. So, welcome, Jerry. How are you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Pretty good. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. All right, excellent. Uh, first of all, I would just like to say as a theist that I'm not going to say I believe in evolution. I'm going to say evolution is true. Right? Yeah. That's like I studied yeah. biology in community college for two years, and granted, I'm no scientist, but it's true. You might but be. My question well, is. My, Worst called me a scientist. My question so. is. My question is not related. I saw Matt debating destiny. And that was yeah. the first time I ever saw, you know, as somebody that goes to church and everything like that, you know, we, we see a lot of these debates. And I had never seen anybody use anything other than personhood as an argument from either side, yeah. right? And so whenever I heard him give the argument for bodily autonomy for the woman, I was kind of like, whoa, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, um, well, that's my argument. So, that's the one that he doesn't like. <laughs> what which one bodily autonomy he, he strategically oh, okay. he agrees with it it's just strategically he doesn't think that it's wise and i think it's the only thing that matters but so you're calling the right person yeah. if you're asking about bodily that's, autonomy go that's, ahead that's that's how i felt i really liked how you drew the distinction between what's moral and what what legal what is a legal right right yep and i was curious about I mean, it's it's almost not even a question. I almost just want to hear you tell me your stance because I'm curious on how that okay. would apply to a father, right? Like if a father decided to remove consent in America, I'm a Texan, um, from wanting to be a father, but then he would be legally held responsible in most cases for, you know, child support and for beating no, the kid. He's already like consented. But, he's already consented. By virtue of the situation, first of all, the, the pregnant person uh, is the one that gets to decide whether or not they're going to carry to term, all that. Their bodily autonomy uh, is there. The unfortunate reality is that when two people do it, one of them gets pregnant and they are governing their body. And so it becomes for the for the, for the father, for the, the, the person who's, uh, well, we'll just, we'll just go with father. Um, the act of having sex puts them in a position where they are taking the risk of being bound to the responsibilities of being a father. It's kind of a, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime thing because you are consenting at the time that you're having sex to saying, if this results in a pregnancy, I acknowledge that I am now tied to this uh, and that the other individual is the one that's going to decide whether or not they, they keep it or have an abortion, but I am now giving my consent to them for whatever happens afterwards. And it's just the unfortunate reality. I mean, you, you don't get a say in it. I mean, like if I went out and I got in my car and I drove down the street, um, <laughs> I'm not consenting to being in an accident but I am consenting to the consequences if an accident occurs. I don't get to say, well, now that we've had an accident, I'm going to withdraw my consent and I'm not going to call my insurance company and do that. It's too late at that point. So legally, uh, I, I agree. The, the hard part for, for any kind of follow-up is that I agree with a lot of what you said about not just now, but in the debate about the woman have, ha having, in a way, ability to remove consent because of what she must put her body no. through over the next nine months, right? No, no, no. So the, the person who ends up pregnant consented to the risk mm -hmm. of pregnancy 
knowing that they would have an option to in, terminate the pregnancy or carry it to term. That's that that is their choice. Um, the other person, when they consented to sex, did so knowing that they wouldn't have a say in that. Now they they may be granted a say. For example, um, when my ex wife was trying to get pregnant, uh, we were we were in on it together, and so because you know we're we were partnered and everything else, I would have had a say, but at the end of it, uh, it's her body, her choice at the end. And I went into that knowing it and anybody who's concerned about, oh my gosh, if I go out and have sex, I could end up, um, you know, making child support payments for the next 18 years. Yes. That's what you consent to the potential risk of that when you go out and engage in sex. So you got to take all the precautions you can and maybe don't just run around having indiscriminate sex with people that you don't have a good enough relationship with to be a grown up with and have a conversation about the eventualities. But yeah, it's, I agree it's with, not I fair. Agree that. I think it's, it's not fair, but it's, it's just the way the would, biology is. I think most of us would agree that it would be morally repugnant for a man to, to remove consent in that situation. I was and, and you know, I understand that it is that is the way that the legal system stands now, but a lot of the times we're talking about the way that the legal system should be or what the legal rights should be sure. in a more perfect society. And, you know, obviously with what's happened over the past year or so with, you know, the Supreme Court, um, some of those rights have been taken away from a woman and are from people who give birth and, um, yep. you know, they shouldn't be that way according to the stance and it is. So her legal right in this argument would be that she shouldn't be legally forced to carry to term. Right. Do you yes. feel that? Because that, that violates bodily that autonomy. Legally, yes. Yes. So do you feel like legally the way that those child support laws are for fathers should remain the way that they are or in other words yes. that that is yes correct but yes. bodily autonomy okay okay yes until such time okay, as well. we enter until such time as we we change the way the biology of reproduction works um when when we enter the future where two people can say hey we want to make a baby and they go into it consenting together with all of the requirements there and that in every other circumstance uh nobody can say okay you know i i'm we don't want to have a baby um but i'm going to force you to have one that you know until we change the way the biology works it unfairly puts one person into a position for nine months if not 18 years and both people have to go into it knowing that that's a potential and and i hear all these people yeah. worrying about it i'm and this is me probably being a little glib jerry um it's like oh this isn't fair this isn't fair i don't ever hear that from guys in committed relationships um I, who, who aren't maybe talking about my, mistresses my, my, this is about this is about people who want to go hook up at a bar um I've had sex with plenty of women and I've had hookups and I've never wound up being a father. Um, yeah, but I, it could I, have happened. I'm married and my wife and I are, are attempting to have children using science because we're older. Right. And so yeah. I, I, um, I'm asking more from an intellectual curiosity, philosophical curiosity standpoint where yeah. I just found that standpoint unique. And I was curious how you guys felt about it on the other foot, if, if the father would, would be afforded the same. Because I don't know, I'm not a debater. So for me, I was thinking, well, the guy has to then consent to go get his body to a workforce, right? And a lot of jobs that anybody does in the world are dangerous to a certain extent, right? And You consent to that. Um, yeah. I see what you're saying. I do see what you're saying. So, um, but that's, that's where I was coming at from it, uh, is from more of just intellectual yep. curiosity. Yeah. In, so, in, in a sense I of find a loophole, I'm not complaining. I would no, it's fine. be a father. I, so it, it's fine. What, what I will say to, to kind of, to wrap this up, um, is sure. do I wish that it could be different? Sure. 
Um, I wish a lot of things about the harshness of reality and how it's unfair uh, towards a number of different individuals. I wish that could be a lot different. And I think that learning science and working uh, on ways to improve and change some of this stuff can fundamentally change the problems that we're, we're dealing with. Um, there, you know, a, a child can sue to be emancipated from their parents. And in some cases, um, the father um, can, f and, and the mother can both forfeit, uh, give up their parental rights. And in that case, the, you know, the child goes up to adoption or becomes a ward of the state, things like that. Um, it's just, as it stands right now, until something changes, the person who's going to be stuck pregnant is the one, the one that's, that, that matters in the decision of what they're going to do with regard to their body. And if any, any dude out there doesn't want to wind up paying 18 years of child support, then exercise don't do the, 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 or don't do the, the caution. Crime. Yeah, don't do the crime. And yeah. make, make sure that you're talking with yeah. your partner, that you're taking all the precautions, yeah. that you guys are on the same page and you're being responsible. Can I, anyway. Can I ask a quick follow-up? on sure on that um what about and again man any trans friend that ever asked me to call them by any pronoun oh i'm going to do it right like I, I want to do it i want to cool. respect what they ask but with that said in some countries like canada and again this is just hypothetical philosophical i'm curious where you stand if you'll be put in jail for misgendering somebody not, you're not, not going to be put in jail it, it, that's not true jerry you're not, not going to be put in jail for misgendering someone in Canada. That's just not true. I, I thought that was the whole debacle from what people were saying is that they were. No, that's the nonsense I mean, that Jordan I Peterson wrong, spread around that nobody ever proposed. There's a lot of stuff yeah. on the internet that, that, you know, we're fed these days, you guys. So, yeah. well, let's yeah. just say then not even that would, would, would you say that any compelled speech by law would violate bodily autonomy? Sure. Yes. I mean, that, I'm, I'm sure that as quickly as I'm willing to say yes, compelled speech would violate bodily autonomy. I'm sure that we could find some sort of exception. But uh, generally speaking, um, I'm opposed to hate speech laws, even though I find some, some good in them, uh, adding an extra penalty for that, anything that tries to compel um, thought or speech. Um, now, it could be that um, compelled non-speech could be an issue, like, you know, you're not allowed to start a riot, um, that, that sort of thing. I agree with that. But yeah, there's already, um, already limits on our free speech. And, and no, you no, know, no. And, and like, I, like I said at the beginning of the, the, the call, I, I really liked how we drew the distinction between uh, moral duties and what's right morally from just the legal side of it, right? Like obviously morally hate speech is repugnant. Well, well I yes. guess we lost Jerry. Oh shit. I thought I was waiting for a butt there. Yeah. It's like mid sentence it still shows him on. I'm going to refresh. Okay. Oh, all right. Sorry, we lost yeah, you, Jerry. I, I don't know if that's a, a problem on your end or my end. Um, so, yeah, this this thing about compelled speech. Um, so, first of all, with regard to people's preferred names or pronouns, you can, at least in the United States and perhaps most other places, you can call someone whatever name you want and use whatever pronouns you want. You don't even have to call them a name. I could just constantly refer to... Uh, Forrest as Prickface McDubadop. Um, and he and, does off camera and frequently. He, he use pronouns that Forrest doesn't like. And there's nothing, uh, nobody can take any action against me other than saying that guy's an asshole that we're not going to promote. We're not going to support. We're not going to show up for his show. We're not going to, if he's not going to treat other people with respect, we're not going to treat him with respect. That's, this is generally what people are talking about across the board. And it's funny that, you know, you look at, uh, like Bob Dylan isn't Bob Dylan's birth name and nobody gives a shit. Um, we, we understand stage names. We understand people change their names. Um, we, we understand people change their, uh, the gender that they identify as and express. We, we understand people change their pronouns. Uh, it's, 
none of this is a matter of you will do this or you'll go to jail. What what Peterson was talking about was the potential of, you know, coming uh, under scrutiny from university policies as well and things like that, or people going too far. And everybody, oh, it's, it's, it's the woke this, the woke this, the woke this. Well, I'm sorry, but some of us will not continue to sleep. Um, in much the same way that liberal is a is a, a label that I wear as a badge of honor, so is woke. You can you can put woke in as many means as you want. You can think it's a dumb label for stuff. I think it's a dumb label for stuff, and yet what it actually points to and stands for, I'm a hundred percent behind. It is the embodiment of humanism and decency and everything that we would want, which is to to care for other people and do what we can to make the world better for people rather than ignoring climate change while we whine about who gets to use which fucking bathroom. I'm, I, I saw somebody the other day uh, complaining that they had nightmares because they they were on the swim team with Leah Thomas and and it's just, oh my gosh, I'm, I might have had to see a penis. Well, the that's not Leah's fault, and it may not even be the individual who's having nightmares' fault. It may be the fault of the society that gave someone so much baggage that they assumed that anyone, uh, that they want to just sum somebody up by their genitalia. Oh, you're a mm -hmm. penis haver, therefore you are a threat. Well, hang on. You're in there changing with probably, I'm going to guess, some lesbians who are, are, are checking you out too. Um, why didn't you have nightmares about that? Oh, it's because you don't view them as a threat. Well, instead of assuming somebody is a threat, why not get to know them? You guys could have wound up being really good friends, and you found out that they were might have been just as uncomfortable with their genitalia as being visible as anybody else was. And there may be lots of different changes that we could make to policies to make it easier for everybody to work together, but you don't sideline an entire group of people. And I wasn't even going to talk about trans stuff today. Well, what gets Damn me it. the most about that whole thing is when people talk about, like, first of all, it is always and only trans women that we argue about with bathroom yes. things. It's like, oh my God, these people, they're, it's going to be a man who puts on a dress and goes in the women's bathroom to go be a predator. Okay, so then your problem was with cis men. Yeah, it, that, That's always what the actual problem is. You're actually concerned about cis men being creepy and using trans people as a vehicle to do that. And so you're using trans people as a scapegoat and taking out your frustrations and fears on them on an already marginalized group to uh, try to dissuade your fear about cis men. Say you do say you have to use your sex assigned at birth and that's your actual bathroom. And so now all the trans women have to use the male bathroom and all the trans we, uh, women, uh, men have to use the female bathroom. Okay, the same cis man who you were worried about before now can just walk into the woman's bathroom without dressing up and just say they're a trans man and they're still in the damn bathroom. It, it's you've now created the same scenario, only stupider. Like I don't it, j just let people shit, man. It's a it's an animal shit house. Why are you this concerned? Oh yeah. my god, it, it drives me up a wall, dude. <laughs> really, uh, it's that's crazy. Really interesting. Let me. Uh, we, There's we a lot like of things five, there. Five calls, <laughs> including a couple from theists. Uh, let me just rattle off the announcements one more time. We'll get right back to that. For sure. Tomorrow on the Transatlantic Call-In Show, it's going to be Katie and Arden. On Sunday, it'll be me and Jimmy on the Sunday show. Both of those shows are at 2 p.m. Central. And uh, on Monday, Force will be back with Erica for what we suspect is going to be another six-hour Skep Talk. All about And I won't remember the announcements one time for that whole show. <laughs> yes. We're, well, no, no. If Arden's producing, Arden will be politely reminding you from the back poking and jimmy I will, will be, be doing politely it ignoring her because i jimmy, do a terrible Jimmy's job thing and jimmy will be even more pushy about getting forced to do the jimmy will just talk over you will. and mute you <laughs> tuesday's gonna be dying out loud with dave warnock and footless joe and next week i'll be back on the hangout with i think right now mind shift skeptic but we'll talk about that we have in texas jimmy whose pronouns are king and lord evidently um who has a question That's for us about, uh, jimmy you're on with forrest and matt yeah, I don't know if you can see my question on the screen. It's basically, do you think there could be in any conceivable way that you could imagine a, a God that you would accept that is aligned with evolution, that doesn't violate any physical law, and that is ultimately dissociated with the supernatural? No. I, I, don't, I don't know what 
the characteristics of that God would be or what qualifies as a God within the classical. I, I'm not saying that a God has to be supernatural. Um, it, it's, I would need a definition of, of what that entity is and why it's justified to consider it a God. Cause it's like, you could say I'm a God and like, if you, if you moved me back in time and, and move me back personally 10 years to when my brain was slightly more functional, uh, I could appear like a God to some primitive culture somewhere, but I would say that the appearance of a God isn't necessarily a God. And so it's certainly none of the gods of classical theism or anything like that would make sense. What, what, what would be the characteristics that you, you think would qualify as a God if it isn't supernatural and doesn't violate any physical laws? Yeah, that's kind of my thing. Is like I, I, when I think about the word God, I think about something with crazy powers to manipulate time, space, matter, blah, blah, blah. Like that, that wouldn't work in reality. So, like, do you have a different definition that we're not using? Yeah, I do. Because that, that was my issue last time when I spoke to Boris, is that he seemed to automatically assume that God should be something that is supernatural. And, you know, maybe I can invoke with something like, you may not agree, but Einsteinian, you know, the uh, Spinoza, Spinozan God. That's, that's not a God. Uh, which I, I associate with like panentheism. I'm sorry, pantheism, but I, I kind of see it more aligned with panentheism as opposed to pantheism. And I guess maybe that's the, more the direction I would take it so, in if I was going to try to define it. So basically, if you just tweak the definition of the word God to be just stuff happening, then we can say that there's God. No, I wouldn't even say that. I don't think it's a tweak at all because this is the way I perceive like a lot of the early philosophers and the way they perceived the word God, uh, the early theologians, um, even, you know, maybe even some Buddhists or, or Hindu yogis, the way they uh, had their perception of God. Uh, of course, they didn't, uh, Hindus don't say God, they say Brahman. And, right. Uh, so, but like, that's the thing Brahman. though, is it like, you're right. A lot of early philosophers and even a lot of scientists have used the word God as sort of a stand into the order of the universe, just the way that shit works. And here's an anthropomorphic way of saying that things happened. And like, that's, that's fine, but that's not the not God that, that like the rest of the people around us, those, that's not the God that my friends and neighbors in my community believe in. And if I were to try to use that definition in common language, it wouldn't get me anywhere. So like, if you want to use this kind of poetic version of God in, in like what's speaking colloquially, I don't think it's going to work. It's just a lot of work for no reward. I, I don't get what you would get out of it to, to do that. I don't believe in any gods what, at all. what I'm saying. Well, that wasn't what I was saying at all. Jimmy, I'm happy to address what you're saying, but when you say that you view it as more as panentheistic, the panentheistic God is a God that transcends the physical. Um, the, the Spinoza's God, that's not a personal being or agent. It's just a metaphor. Are you talking about God as a metaphor or God as an actual thinking agent? Well, when you say actual thinking agent, I, I do believe this God would possess consciousness, but not necessarily volition as in a thinking agent per se, just merely where, consciousness. In, in a, where so, would, where so, would it so, derive consciousness if not from yeah. a brain? Yeah. Well, I, I don't really think that uh, consciousness is something necessarily generated by a brain. Uh, not a, Can not you have me an example? example? Do you have any example of consciousness absent a brain? No, that's well, what I mean is that I think the brain is a type of medium through which consciousness occurs, but I don't think okay, it's a okay, generator. But, Jimmy, what 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 evidence Jimmy, do you have to support it, that assumption? Like where are you getting that? Well, that the brain is more like Michio Kaku who talks about in uh, kind of like a radio transceiver that we tune in to this one, Jimmy, we asked you know, universe, for evidence. Uh, we uh, asked for Jimmy, we asked for evidence. We didn't ask you to cite a kook. 
uh, cite evidence that well i don't think you know the, there is evidence we can necessarily point to because uh you know super string okay theories, so those are already in theory, so the jimmy science that we jimmy no answers for. jimmy jimmy why would you believe something as big as i think the brain is a medium for consciousness to to to, to project through if you admit that you don't have evidence for that why are you running around believing things without evidence I have a totally different line of questioning whenever we're done with this one, so don't I, hang up well, on I, I, um, I do. Uh, I, I'm not a theoretical physicist, but I, you know, I, I don't. Jimmy? Dismiss I don't. Thing. Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy. That's not what he asked. I didn't ask you if you were a theoretical physicist. I asked, why are you believing things that you admit you don't have evidence for? I, well, I'm telling you why. I, you know, I, I'm I'm not just accepting like, okay, well, I don't know. I'm tr I'm trying to extrapolate from what we know now. I'm no. hypothesizing, considering Jimmy. Things, you know, I, I'm Jimmy. That's a why. hypothesis needs to be testable, which means it also needs to falsifiable. And the process of testing a hypothesis involves gathering evidence. Don't pretend like what you're doing is hypothesis testing. I'm asking why are you advocating for a position that you admit you don't have evidence for? If your answer is, I'm just pulling out of my butt and I can't prove it to anybody, that's fine, but don't waste my time. Sure, but do you think theoretical physicists say like I just pulled these multi dimensions out of my butt? Jimmy, I don't think that's not even I close think, to don't, the same I, thing. Jimmy, I'm not asking you any questions about theoretical physicists. How is my asking you to justify your position in any way responded to by you talking about theoretical fucking physicists? Well, because you, you you want concrete evidence right now, and that's something we don't have. Jimmy, you know, if you're a okay, I'm going to mute you because I'm going to start yelling. <laughs> I'm asking you, Jimmy, what evidence you fucking have for the position you've stated. If I'm going to unmute you in a second, and I'm going to I'm going to get an answer to my question, and then Forrest has a different line of questions. I'm going to ask you the question one more time. And I would like for you to respond to it. But if you say theoretical physics, theoretical physicists, or talk about what other people do with their other beliefs, I'm going to mute you again because that is irrelevant. If somebody says to me, Matt, why do you believe this? I don't go, well, theoretical physicists are making shit up too. So, Jimmy, do you have any evidence? for your proposed view on the brain and consciousness? I don't think any of us do. Not I, not you, not Forrest, for any ultimate conclusion about God. Yes, I do. Okay. So, so hang on. I'm muting you again. Jimmy, <laughs> I asked you if you had any evidence, and your answer was, I don't think I do or you do or anybody does None about God. Do. You, sir, are dishonest as fuck. The answer to my question was no, you don't have evidence. However, the question wasn't about God. It was about consciousness and the brain. And whether or not I or Forrest have evidence for our positions or not is a separate issue. I'm going to unmute you, and I'm going to let Forrest ask his line of questions. But I, get, I, I tell you this right now, if you do not pay attention and answer the question that's asked and behave honestly, I will drop this call because I have no more patience for your time-wasting crap. Go ahead, Forrest. Uh, so it's really quick. Two things. Number one, I just want to point out that consciousness is the realm of neuroscience. So, like, I'm sure lots of theoretical physicists have lots of ideas about it. It's a thing that neuroscientists are studying, and they have a lot of cool ideas about it. And not a single neuroscientist I've ever even heard of would argue that consciousness is some sort of field that your brain is able to tap into. It's pretty obviously a function of the brain, we're, we don't know the very most fundamental parts of it yet, but we don't know the very most fundamental parts of lots of things. And just because uh, if we didn't know how the earth was formed, that wouldn't be a reason for us to say that plate tectonics might be some like ethereal magical thing being guided through the universe, being transmitted through the earth. Like it, that's silly. Do you see why that's silly? Well, neuroscience is uh, the neuroscience doesn't even have evidence that consciousness is even generated by the brain there's no evidence for that in we, neuroscience. there's there's so a ton I of it you. there's a ton of it I, there's there's, there's a ton of very obvious evidence 
Can you name one? Yeah, changes to the brain, oh, alter consciousness. That would be a good one. That's not one. I'm talking about a citation something, you know, something legitimate. Well, I'm not going to pull up a citation for you here. We're just talking about evidence. I'm not going to cite yeah, my ahead. sources because I'm not going to go dig time. into Google Scholar at this moment. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you what, fucker. We'll take as wait, much time wait, as we want, and wait, it starts by me I'm, hanging up on your ass. I've Goodbye. got one more. Wait, wait, wait. Don't hang up on him yet. No. Yeah, is he still there? No. Damn it. <laughs> oh, I had one more thing I wanted to know. I wasn't interested in that line of questioning at all. I was, I was going to just throw I'm that sorry, out there because I was – it's okay. I hit my limit on the – no, no, no. Give me evidence and you take as much time as you want. Bullshit. Um, like yeah. I'm going to sit here and fucking go to Google Scholar and pull something up. Like that's not my, that's not my job to do that for you is I'm not doing your homework. I'm telling you a line of evidence that I learned in neuroscience class in college that we talked about that exact thing. So like, sorry, take it up with them. Uh, no, I wanted to talk to him about pronouns because his pronouns were king and lord. And I wanted to ask, like, if he knew what pronouns were and what they're used for. That's what I wanted to do, because I can't say he had a bunch of dumb arguments and, and I didn't know how to talk to him. I would have to say King had a bunch of bad arguments and I didn't know how to talk to Lord. Why does that fucking make any sense to you, dude? Why would you like you have to be just deliberately just looking for a reason to be an asshole to give pronouns like that. And I wanted to know if you knew how grammar worked and you fucked it up. Ah, <laughs> oh, sad yeah. times. I did. I, I, I wish I'd let you ask him about the pronouns, but honestly, um, this individual who decides that despite um, not having any scientific evidence for his proposition thinks he's tapped in because of Michio Kaku uh, to the secret of how the brain works and that it right. is actually a conduit for something else, something he has no evidence for. Meanwhile, all of the available evidence shows that consciousness or thought is a product of the brain. Now, it could be more than that as well, but at a minimum, it is that. And neuroscience and being able to, uh, for example, mirror neurons and listening to people like V.S. Ramachandran talking about split-brain patients who have, in order to stop uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, have gone through a hemispherectomy and they end up with two distinct consciousnesses, two individuals who communicate independently, one of them communicating verbally and one of them communicating written uh, in the same brain, one of which is an atheist, one of which is a theist. I know the exact thing you're talking about. <laughs> that, I'm sorry that King Lord, the dipshit of Pronounville, is completely uninformed on the basics of neuroscience, but my position is that consciousness is in every circumstance that we can identify completely correlated with brain activity. And no consciousness has been observed or detected absent brain activity. And yet, despite that strong correlation, he's concluded that the brain is a conduit for something else. But even if that was the case, I just realized that, oh, Jay Morgan, guess what button I'm allowed on now? Somebody said I shouldn't be allowed on the button. I got a ban <laughs> button too. Bring it, bitch. Well, snap. Uh, but when you say that, that there's a consciousness that is God, but it's not an agent, and you say there's a consciousness absent a brain, even if you felt that the brain was the conduit for consciousness being something else, you have no reason to think that that God consciousness can operate without a similar conduit. So even his model doesn't demonstrate what he thinks it does. But Matt, even though I just literally just reached behind me and pulled out my undergraduate neuroscience notebook and I scrolled through here and I didn't find anything at all about you know consciousness existing outside of a brain, that doesn't mean that we can't prove that it isn't real and that means it just might be. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, we're we're running behind, and we got more more theists and stuff here. I want to make sure we get to Spencer in Georgia is an agnostic theist who wants to talk briefly. I hope about presuppositionalism because I I'm I'm kind of done with precepts, but I I get your question. So welcome, Spencer. You're on with Forrest and me. Yeah, Hello. no, uh, I'm not a presuppositionalist, I guess, but I I want to know what advice you would have for somebody who is recognized that theism is irrational but still finds appeal in the sort of like Seiten Bruggen Tate everyone secretly believes in God type argument like it still makes sense to me I still feel that I sort of have that knowledge even though I recognize that I don't have any rational reason to believe in it does that make any sense yeah, except that no. what you're talking about isn't Cy Ten Bergen Kate's presuppositionalism. So presuppositionalism is presupposing God as an explanation for either the foundation of logic or the foundation of morality or something like that. It has nothing to do with everybody believes in God. That's not what presuppositionalism you, is. And and that shouldn't have any you, appeal you've because heard I that don't, argument though. I, I've heard the argument that everybody believes in God. It's bullshit. I don't believe in God. How can that possibly have an appeal right. when it's demonstrably false? So I guess I didn't, I thought that those were synonymous, so I'm sorry about that. But in that debate, you said exactly that, that you don't feel that knowledge. And I didn't know what to do with that because I feel like I kind of do, and I don't know what to do with it. Because I that's think a, that's a you, that that's a you problem. I recognize that it's irrational. Yeah. But I guess so I'm, 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 asking what you would do if you felt if you were in a similar situation if you recognizing the when, logical arguments that it was irrational I, still had that what okay i i don't under i genuinely i don't understand how someone can sit here and say i recognize my theism is irrational but i'm still a theist that makes no sense to me because when i recognized that my theism was irrational i was incapable of maintaining it no matter how much i might have wanted to i cannot keep believing something that i know to be irrational and so what you're saying doesn't make sense to me. Sure. And and I wouldn't necessarily say that as a theist. I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on these terms. That's why I said agnostic theist. I'm not really sure. But I guess I'm kind of in between. I guess the kind of God who would want you to go through not necessarily an irrational route, but or maybe an irrational route. It, it, just, it makes a little bit of sense to me still. So it makes sense to you that there's a God out there who wants you to believe even though it's irrational. A little bit, yeah. How does and, that make sense? Well, please explain well, to me uh, how something can be God irrational. Be. At, basically, your God's fucking with you. Your God is punking you, and you think that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm not. Uh, Your God sounds like a dick. agnostic theist. I'm more towards the atheistic end of things. That, but I that can't God sounds take like a that, dick that remnant me. of it. Yeah, well, it, but I mean, it's like if he has that power, you know. I guess uh, it's you fall into Pascal's wager. You know, I'm not gonna. Pascal's wager is an absolutely nonsensical position that only contrasts a very specific type of atheism, a very specific type of Christianity, with a very specific view on atheism. It it is it is not the safe bet. It is not true that you give up nothing. You are giving up the truth and every bit of truth, and you are sitting here advocating for a Loki esque prankster god that you have zero evidence for, but it makes sense in its not making sense. Um, that sounds to me like well, fear talking. Yeah, for sure. I, I think well, you're right. I, I would recommend reaching out to recoveringfromreligion.org and possibly the Secular Therapy Project to see what your specific fears are and how to get over them. But let's assume for a second that there is a God out there that, that I should be afraid of, and he's a complete asshole. Um, yeah. Uh, I would be perfectly willing if there were evidence to believe that that God exists and still absolutely refuse to worship or respect him. I thought that you would say that. And that doesn't make any sense at all to me. 
to make that stand considering what the consequences might be so if you thought if you thought that the the king was a corrupt piece of shit would you sit there and take it or would you work on a rebellion i mean if the consequences were sufficiently bad i i didn't even they might consider i mean you know it's hard to die on a on a moral high ground like that not for me it would be tough for me to take that stand against a human king even yeah and 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 why is it harder to take it against a gun a being that you don't have any evidence even exists the scale of of hell is just i mean when so, you really so then, think about it just can you can you even admit then honestly that like this god if it's real if you're this terrified of it cannot possibly be good any god oh yeah that would say you must do xyz thing otherwise i will torture you in a pit that you can't even fathom like that's not a good dude right yeah ab absolutely at least by our so, by a human standpoint cool. so this god is kids, evil but I guess I, I the disconnect here is I cannot imagine being in your shoes and being willing to take that stand, mm -hmm. not even against the human king, but against that level you, of consequence. Do you have any kids? I don't. Do you have anybody you love? Sure, of course. If somebody was threatening to punch someone you love in the throat, and you were standing right next to them, what would you do? I, I would definitely try to intervene, and I hope that I would do so, even if the consequences were deadly. If the consequences were deadly, though, I might not. I hope I would, but I what can't if, really speak to that. What situation. if somebody said, what if somebody said they were praying to their magical friend to have that magical friend to punch your, your loved one in the throat? What would you do then? I guess I wouldn't do anything. You you wouldn't do anything. If they were just praying, okay. I guess. Well, you what if you know their magical friend? I mean, are, are you saying you don't believe in their magical friend that's going to punch them in the throat because you were going to try and stop them if they did it, but you're not going to stop their magical friend? By magical friend, you mean the god? Sure, it's analogous okay. to a god. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, if they were praying, though, that doesn't necessarily, they're not commanding the god. So I would be okay with it because it would be. Okay, Spencer, I, get, I give up. I give up. Um, whatever damage has been done to make you so fearful, um, it, it's really frustrating. So here's yeah. the thing. I've just gotten a message. No, I'm sorry. I wrote no, down that stop website. Stop talking. Listen, listen. I've just now gotten a message from my magical friend who says he's going to come punch your, your mom in her throat and slaughter her if you don't give me $500 right now. I see what you're saying. Are you are you going to give me money to appease I, my magical friend? No. Why not? Because I'm not as a, I'm not a, I'm not afraid of your magical friend. My magical friend is Jesus of Nazareth. Are you afraid of my magical friend now? Yes, but I don't. Why? Well, I mean, because the things Jesus said about himself are. Do you have any terrifying. reason to think that Jesus existed or that you have a single word that you know that Jesus ever said? 
I will freely admit that I don't I don't have any rational right. reason. And yet, and yet, me changing the name of my magical friend to Jesus of Nazareth fundamentally changed that. That is absolutely the indoctrination of fear. You don't have any more evidence for my magical friend being Jesus than before that, and yet that one you're you're afraid of, and that's something that's been done to you, and you need to reach out to an expert, not me, not Forrest, perhaps somebody from the Psychotherapy Project or at Recovering from Religion, um, in order to get to grips with how you can and not be afraid of things that aren't real. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I want to add one thing. I, the, I know that this has already been, been beaten to death here, talking about, you know, this, this you know, I said it was a magical person and you said you didn't care. And then I said it was Jesus and you said you did care. At that point, you said the reason why you cared about Jesus was because of the things that Jesus said about himself. And Matt pointed out that you have no connection to this Jesus person. Satya Sai Baba uh, was born in uh, 1926, died in 2011. So there's a modern person. They were alive when you and I were both alive. Uh, this person had millions of followers, claimed to be the Messiah, uh, healed the sick, raised the dead, did all sorts of miraculous things. Um, this is a person who claimed many of the same things as Jesus and and even many more. As You can look up the miracles this guy is supposed to have performed and was alive at our time. What about this dude? Is this dude a concern of yours in any way? No, but... And, and I recognize that that's because I was not I, a part of that religion. I Right, but that's time. what I wanted to, like, Matt talked about just an ethereal magical friend, and you were able to dismiss it because it was just a whatever, right? But when you talked about Jesus, you yeah. specifically said the things that Jesus said about himself, despite you having no connection, were what made it serious. So I figured, rather than just having an ethereal magical hypothetical friend, here's a real dude that we can agree actually existed, and said the same things. So, what's your criteria here? I mean, I guess I guess I, I really have three reasons for holding on still. One, because I still have not just in not just an inherent feeling of knowledge of God, but of my religion being true, in a sense that I can't shake. Fear of hell, and I'm assuming, I don't know if this guy talked about hell at all, uh, but also sort of the uniqueness, and I've never heard of anyone who defected from it other than me. I mean, sure, there, there, this guy had millions of followers. I'm sure there were plenty of uh, defectors. And also there are eyewitnesses today alive that say that this guy levitated, that he materialized fruit from nothing. Uh, that he was clairvoyant and could see the future, um, and that he performed magical healings. So this is a a real person who has millions of followers who claims that he has all these magical powers. He said many of the same things that Jesus said about himself, and then he died in 2011. Are you scared of him? No. Do exactly it's what you're doing right now of, with that guy, with Jesus, and see what happens to you. Yeah, I, I, I think Matt may be right. This might be a professional, emotional thing because I have a lot of emotions wrapped up in what I was a part of. Still, I was going to say, say you know, I would, watched. Uh, and and I'm watched, not in any way uh, trying Matt, to. I'm not in any way trying to knock it or diminish it, but uh, this is this is more. It's take the food for thought from me and from Forrest, and uh, sit down, do some thinking. Because and, and and you may not get there anytime soon. You may not reach the the same position that we're at. Maybe you'll find good evidence or good reason to keep believing. Um, but by and large. When, when we reach a point like this in deconstruction, what we're talking about is fear. And in this case, the fear that, that you're, you're allowing to uh, control you 
is fear that is not tied to anything that is demonstrable or testable. And I did something when I was a kid that made finding my way out of religion uh, a little easier. And that is, I was, I would occasionally do one of these, okay, God, if you're real, you know, do this or okay, God, if you're real, stop me from doing that. Okay, God, if you're real, you know, just tell me something, anything. And each one of those failed. Now I'm, I know the Bible as well, or better than most anybody who sat in the pew. And so there's the, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Um, why not? What, what, what could a God possibly fear from being put to the test? Uh, it either passes the test or it fails. If it passes, great. If it fails, that still doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and God would know this. God would know the fallacy fallacy. And so I'm not afraid of any God being able to give me so much as a hangnail, which is why it's really easy for me to point out that I could believe in a God and still never worship it, because worship is something that I am actively opposed to. Respect I'm not, and I'm willing to respect any being, God or not, that acts in a way that is deserving respect, but I will not respect anyone who demands it on pain of, of dire consequences. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even care if there are no consequences. If somebody just demands respect, go fuck yourself. I've met plenty of celebrities, uh, people with you know, millions of followers, and they're known all, all this, and we either engage each other as human beings and talk to each other as equals, or I don't give a fuck to talk to them. I, I'm, I'm, you know, only once or twice have I ever been remotely starstruck. One of them, one of them was when I met Steve Jackson, who runs Steve Jackson Games, which is a mile from my house. Um, just because I, that was true admiration for what somebody had done um, that most people wouldn't even notice. But yeah, I, I would reach out and and do some thinking, and don't try to fix it all in one one sitting on a phone call. Yeah, well, I was just wondering if you you had any experience with that kind of believing that everyone certainly believes in god including yourself that you have that inherent i knowledge. used to believe that i used to believe that and then when i realized that it didn't okay. make any sense and couldn't be true i stopped believing it and now i don't believe in god okay so, so i know have that experience i did i have the experience of being convinced that everybody believed in god yes But that's because I was told everybody believed in God, and since God was real in my mind at the time, it made sense that everybody believed in God. God has written his moral code on your heart. Yeah. So while okay. I believed, it made sense to me at the time that everybody believed in God. When I realized that not everybody didn't believe in God, by the way, as a Christian, you can't believe that everybody believes in a God because you are commissioned in Mark 16 and, and elsewhere, to go out and tell them. If, if everybody believed in God, God, there would be no reason for a great commission to go ye therefore unto all the nations and preach the gospel. Oh, well, they believe in a God, they just don't know the gospel. No, we know about the Paraha who have no God concept at all. All of these things prove that people don't all believe in a God, and certainly not, they don't all know that there's a God. And as soon as it got to a point where I didn't believe, that was, I mean, the mere fact that I didn't believe proves it entirely false, and I'm done. I don't have to do anymore. Yeah. So, so now your choice is, is it more likely that Matt and Forrest and everybody else who's here on the line uh, and in all of the atheist communities, is it more likely that all of these professed atheists are actively lying or that this concept that everybody believes in God is wrong? Well, that's sort of the problem is, is I can't get into anybody's head, so I, I, I really don't know. You don't Do you believe have, in the Bible. None of us, just none of us, none of us can get into anybody more. else's head. I, 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 you don't need to get into somebody else's head to say, "Hey, 
There are millions of people who say they don't believe in a God. What are the odds that all of them are lying versus what are the odds that this bald assertion that has no evidence at all, that all of them are lying? Which one's more likely? The bald assertion being that, that everyone believes in God. You, you think that's mm -hmm. more likely to be true than, than that? Okay, so you're basically saying Force and I are lying. Thanks. I mean, you could be. I could not know. I, I'm so glad we sat here and so tried to help know. you so that you could say that it's more likely that we're liars. Why did you call us if you think it's more likely well, we're I, lying? That's fucking bullshit. Do you believe, I didn't say that. I, do you believe in the Bible? You, I, I didn't say it. Um, I mean, no, but it does kind of affect me emotionally, if that makes sense. Well, like, is is the is what the Bible says about God a good, you know, like, actual description of what this God is and the rules around That's him? the only description of any God that seems in any way reasonable to me that, or in any way believable in to judges, me. In Judges chapter 6, uh, God comes to this dude named Gideon and is telling him to do some shit. And Gideon says, before I believe you and before I start doing the shit you want me to do, uh, I'm going to put a fleece on the ground. And if there is in the morning, if there is dew on the fleece, but not the, er, the, the everything around it, if the ground is dry, but the fleece is wet by the morning dew, then I'll believe that you're really God. And then I'll do what you say. And sure enough, that's exactly what God does. And God did so that night. It was dry upon the fleece only, and the, there was dew all on the ground. Sorry, I got it backwards. Um, oh no, actually, yeah, he does it twice. Yeah. Problem, he does it twice. Yeah. He does it. He does it with the fleece first, and then he does it backwards. He says, "Okay, well now, now the next day, make the ground wet and the fleece dry. Try it backwards." And so God does tests. He's like, "If you're really God, do this weird fucking shit, and then I'll believe you." And then I'll do the thing you say. And God does two weird ass tests and passes them. So no faith required. The God the, of the, the Bible problem. is clearly cool with that. So do that. There's, no, go there's go run some tests. Oh, damn. No. I thought that was a fun way. No. All right. What's the problem? No. The problem is, is, is that the individual believed there was a God. They were just seeking verification that they were talking to God. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. See, this is why I need people like you who actually, you know, used to believe this to, to, to fact check me because like that's or to, to, to check my assertions. Cause like I thought that was it. How, like if you if however, you want to figure out this God, go run some God tests. You know what I mean? However, the, the closer one is to go to like Psalm 14 1, where it says, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. The specific phrasing there is, and and you can claim that they are just in denial, but when you say the fool hath said in their heart there is no God, what what it's actually saying there is essentially um, that this would be their sincere position. And, and by the way, Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Let's say that since you already think I'm lying, um, that I have said, in fact, in my heart that there is no God. Do you also believe that I have done nothing good? No, I don't believe that. Then the Bible's wrong. Throw it out. Yeah. It also says right after that that nobody's good. True. I'm looking at, I, I, pulled, I pulled that one up. It says, The fool said in his heart, There is no God. They're corrupt. They've done abominable works. There's none that, doing good, uh, that, have, that doeth good. And then the second verse here, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that do us good. No, not one. So, like, if you think that there's good people in the world at all, you, you don't believe in this. But in any case, Spencer, I got to move on. All right. Well, I did want to say I'm huge fans of both of you, and I watch all your videos. So, I was very grateful to talk to you okay. directly. Well, someday I'll convince you I'm not lying. <laughs> you guys have a good night. You too. Take care. Whew. That was a fun one. This is not oh. not the call for me. This is much more up your alley. I tried to jump jump in with Bible stuff, and of course, you blew me out of the water. So, I wanna... yeah, um, we we've got a handful of calls, and we're 
I, I still want to, we still got to get super chats and other stuff here. Um, but I want to make sure I, I always want to try and get Theus in. Um, so Tanaka somewhere in the USA, uh, pronouns are he, her an agnostic theist. Uh, welcome. You're on the show with Forrest and Matt. Hey, Forrest. Hey, Matt. How you guys doing tonight? I'm all right. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> I already asked that. So uh, it says, my question it says, kind of you have, mm -hmm. it says you have two questions. One is about is there anything sacred or holy in the atheist worldview? And the other is what came before the plank time? And uh, I'll answer the second one first, even though I'm not the science guy. I have no way of knowing what's before the plank time, and I don't think anybody else does either. Well, no, I actually, I'd like to give you my theory about what came before the plank time. I don't care. Um, if I, I do, can. Do you, is, you, is your theory about what came before the plank time something that you can back up with evidence? I think it makes kind of good sense. I think it makes. I, I don't I care. Think it is common sense. Nope. No, I'm sorry, but you know, the speculation about prior to the plank time, unless you have some scientific evidence and a way to do a model, is just time wasty stuff for me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Then, uh, cool. well, how about the first question then? First is there anything okay. sacred or holy in an atheistic worldview? No, nothing that in a nothing about an atheist. An atheistic worldview is just a worldview that doesn't include a god. However, I'm a humanist and I'm a skeptic, and so the the things that would come closest to sacredness and holiness for me are things like honesty, fairness, uh, curiosity, doubt, things like that. Um, the the reverence for. Um, the pursuit of knowledge and truth, um, those things are, I would put as, 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 as close to sacred and holy. They're not truly sacred and holy to me. What about you, Forrest? Yeah, I would say like the, the most important thing about what you just said was the words for me. Um, atheism is simply the single position on a single issue. Is there a God? I don't think so. And that's it. So like you, you can right. have Republican atheist, Democrat atheist, conservative atheist, liberal atheist, a very nice atheist, very mean atheist is, you know, if you ask what's sacred and holy, by definition, I guess nothing because there's no God. So there's no such thing as sacred and holy in that way. But in terms of like what's deeply, seriously important, that varies from person to person. I would agree largely with what Matt said, but you could, I guarantee you can find another atheist out there that would think something completely different. Do you mind if I make a comment? Go for, Go it. for it. Yeah. Um, so I've been like I experience a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance, and I appreciate uh, your shows, Matt and Forrest. I've seen you guys a lot over the years. Been watching your content for the past about sixteen, seventeen years, maybe, and have it's been a tribute a lot of my deconstructing as as it is so far to the content that I've seen with you two and and some other hosts. And uh, one thing that keeps me stuck in my faith as it were and i don't have many proofs or not to not any of them really no evidence i would say to prove why i believe i just believe on faith granted faith isn't a reliable pathway to truth i just believe because i hope it's true and that's because i just think that if I were to deconstruct and come out of faith and religion all the way, that hope in my life, I would be totally devoid of hope, and I'd become a total nihilist. Hope, hope for what? And as Nietzsche, hope for love, hope for a life or a meaning so, or some kind so of anything, on. really. Hang on. Uh, do you think Forrest and myself have a life that is devoid of love or meaning? I wouldn't say that. That would be just too judgmental of me, I think. Well, I, I'm, right. I'm right. asking you to make the judgment. Uh, do, I just, are you conv do you think that Forrest and I experience love and that our lives have meaning? Yes. Okay. So Radical. if you think that's the case for two avowed atheists, <clears throat> why do you think that your experience would be different? Because, well, I guess, and I, I, I struggle to share this on your show because I've shared this on some shows with the ACA before and they've gotten kind of smocked at a little bit and shrugged off. 
Like, I'm almost hypnotized into believing in God and into my faith because I have schizoaffective disorder, uh, formerly diagnosed as schizophrenia because I hear voices from God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and a various assortment of other angelic voices and extra-dimensional beings that always say very affirmative and positive things to me. You know, I take medication for it. And I kind of in in a 50-50 stance on it, one foot in, one foot out. And uh, I'm almost hypnotized and is still believing in it. And uh, it makes me feel good. And, and I don't, why would I want to believe that I have a mental disorder rather than believing that I'm hearing all these wonderful voices from angels? So because the scientific evidence is... and the doctors that are trained to diagnose a mental disorder have told you that you have one. Yeah. That's and what, true. what you're, yeah. what you're no, that, suggesting that then sense. is that you don't you, you care more about mm -hmm. your comfort and how you feel than about the facts of reality. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. We all want comfort and we all want security, and yet we yep. all want to be secure the, the, in the facts the, of reality. No, no. The, the issue here isn't whether or not we all want comfort and security. The issue here is whether some of us value comfort and security over truth. And you are valuing your comfort over truth. And so when you said that you were concerned about deconverting that because you figure you'd end up like loveless and, and without meaning. And then when I pointed out, you're convinced that Forrest and I experience love and our lives have meaning, and there's no reason to think your life would be any different. Then you switched your reason. You switched from, I don't want to give this up because I don't want to have a life without love and meaning to, I don't want to give this up because I have schizoaffective disorder uh, uh, or I've been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. And it's more comforting for me to think that I'm actually hearing from God and Jesus than to realize that I don't. Well, it seems to me that you already realize you're not actually hearing from God or Jesus, but you enjoy the perception that you're hearing from God. And That's the truth. You're right. Yeah. And if that's the case, then you don't believe. You're just enjoying um, the the deception that you are willingly engaged with. Now, I have or, or the zero. Ex uh, sure, um, I have zero expertise here, and I I can't really give you advice, um, and I'm not going to give um, medical advice other than talk to your doctors, listen to your doctors. But if I tell you this, if Doctors had diagnosed me with anything serious, uh, schizoaffective disorder, schizotypal disorder, whatever it is. Um, I can't tell you what I would do because I'm not in that position. But I can tell you what mm -hmm. I'd like to have happen. Um, I would like for, the, for my doctors and the people around me to convince me to follow the best medical evidence and guidance to make sure that even if my life was less fun, it was more true because that's what I value. If you don't value that, then, you know, take wh whatever path uh, works best for you. Um, but it sounds to me like you're starting to realize that you don't believe this stuff and you're looking for maybe somebody else to give you permission to not believe. And while that's not my job, I'm happy to tell you that I experience plenty of love and I have plenty of meaning in my life. And what I also have is truth and fun. And I can't guarantee that's going to be the same for anybody or, or else. But if, if those are the things that you're afraid of not experiencing, um, if you're afraid of falling into nihilism, I can tell you there's plenty of atheists that fall into nihilism, um, but mm -hmm. that is reparable as well. I would also point so out that I actually am a nihilist in a lot of ways. <laughs> I, I, I like cosmic nihilism as a school of philosophy, and I'm also having a lot of fun out here. Like, I, it's, that's not even a bad thing necessarily. There, there's different types of nihilism. It's not worth talking about right now. I'm just saying, like, there's still cool ways to say that it's all bullshit and, and still have a smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.
But like, but the thing is, is like, if you're an atheist, isn't it till death do you part forever? But if you're a Christian, it yeah. gets to be forever. No. Yeah. If you're a but Christian, you matter. have the delusion of forever. You're not going to actually live forever. Like what? One of those things is actually true, and one of those things we have a good reason to believe. And so, like right. the 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 one that happens to actually be true is as it like, as as it turns out, the one that we have the most reason to believe is the one that's most likely to be true, which is that yeah, when you're dead, you're just dead, and that's that's the end of it. Um, and that's you're scary sometimes to grapple with. Yeah, that's scary sometimes to grapple with. Um, as someone who has been around a lot of dead people in my life, like it's freaky sometimes to kind of wrap your brain around what's going on there. Uh, but at the end of the day, that doesn't change the reality of the thing. And it doesn't change your ability to find meaning, find happiness, any of that. Like that's, that's just, it's, it's a thing that you have to now work around, but you're still able to work around it. You're just going down a different road. Doesn't mean you can't keep progressing forward. Right. Well, like I guess I'm looking for a way out. Yeah, I'm looking for a way out, and this really helped. Thank you, guys. Cool. And no worries. I wish you the best. Thanks. Always remember, uh -huh. you can reach out to recoveringfromreligion.org, the Secular Therapy Project, all of those things um, are, are there specifically for this kind of thing. Now, um, you know, Tanaka may have uh, needs that other people uh, don't. And, you know, it's, it's difficult because I don't have an expertise in dealing with a lot of those things. Um, and it's, but I, I appreciate the fact that somebody is willing to say, you know, hey, I've got these issues and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this way and I don't know what to do about it. Because there are yeah. plenty of people who are in similar positions who never reach out for any help. It's just like, I've got a comforting delusion. I'm, you know, fat, dumb, and happy here. Why would I ever change that? Um, th those are real uh, concerns that people have. And some people are more comfortable just hanging on to uh, whatever delusion they're enjoying at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It's rough, man. We have waiting forever. My apologies, but I've got to give priority to this. Ryan in Georgia is an atheist who's been on hold for two and a half hours. So, Ryan, hey. the floor is yours. Hey. Uh, yeah, I, I called uh, July 23rd. I talked to uh, you, Matt, and Jimmy about my mother uh, just diving deeper into religion and how it's kind of made her just willing to believe a bunch of conspiracy theorist stuff and how to remove that delusion, but not r remove her base faith thing. Um, yeah, I've, I, 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 I was calling back in because, uh, you guys said I maybe should, uh, I've talked to her since then. I believe I've come to the conclusion that she's just not going to change her mind about it. But I would still like to show her some uh, like great things about the universe and science and how we know what we know. And uh, I, I saw that Forrest was on tonight, and I, I really respect you, Forrest. Uh, you, you, your, your Light of Evolution series really it, it's 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 amazing. Uh, Thank you. I, I I, I want to say yeah. I, 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 I okay. Sorry. I, I'm gonna no. I'm gonna I'm gonna. Take a moment, step away from the computer, leave you here with Forrest to answer because you and I have ever had this discussion. Um, I just want to express one concern just for you to think about. It really feels like you went off to have a conversation with your mom. You're convinced that she's not going to change her mind, and yet you're still looking for some way to change her. And I, I, I want you, no matter what answer Forrest gives, at some point to consider who are you actually doing this for? Is this, you know, is your mom at risk? Is she at harm? Are you doing this to save her? Or are you doing this to benefit yourself so that you have a mom that's not a conspiracy theorist? Because at the end of the day, if your goal is to change someone to make them more of who you want, that can work. I, but that, yeah, that I, 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 I actually, 
Yeah, I'm very glad you brought that up because I didn't think of it that way. But now that you said it, it makes sense that I I do think I probably am doing it for my benefit just so I can feel closer to my mom. That's a really hard thing to have to deal with, dude. Yeah. I am now on but the I, full that, screen. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I like like I, I love science, and she doesn't accept a good bit of it. And I, I yeah. basically what I wanted to ask you for us was, uh, is there like a really like I I, I don't want to use this term like to be demeaning, but like is there a dumbed down version that I can give her for evolution and like how we know what we know? Yeah, man. Um, so like the biggest thing for me in terms of like evolution in a way that anybody could understand is just like basic neo-Darwinian natural selection. Just that's just our the most most fundamental understanding of it. Um because if you try to talk about fossils, well, the fossils are fake, or well, you know, whoever's funding the study finds the fossil or whatever. Like if you try to talk about radiometric dating, oh well, that's all, you know made up except for when we need it for stuff like commerce and then it's real but other, all the other times it's all fake and like, you know it's all these things so for me what i would say is this this is how i teach evolution to people who are skeptical of it and it's also how i teach evolution to like middle schoolers when i'm presenting the idea the first time is three basic things that we have to agree on number one is that genes exist and they're heritable from from parent to offspring right if I were to ever reproduce, my offspring would inherit my genes, all right? And we, we can all agree that that's the case. If you don't believe that's the case, just note the fact that you look about the same as your parents and that your children look about the same as you, right? Um, so most creationists, we can get on the same page with that. The second thing is that different flavors of genes exist. Matt and I talked quite a bit at the beginning of the show about alleles and why there are some biologists that even don't use the word gene anymore, right? So these alleles are different versions of the same gene. So those definitely exist. And if you don't believe that, take into account the fact that, you know, your parents have different facial features and you look more like one than the other in some ways and more like the other than the first one in other ways. And you have your dad's eyes and your mom's nose and blah, blah, blah. This is we're seeing the it, the difference of alleles, dominant versus recessive alleles. Again, everything that I'm saying here has variation and interesting little tidbits to it, but this is just the basics. Um, so if we can get to those two things, then I guarantee you already understand evolution because the third thing is different alleles are better suited for life in different environments. You can have all the best alleles for being a penguin and you're going to die in the Amazon. And you're going to have all the best alleles for being a boa constrictor and you're going to die in Antarctica. There's no such thing as the perfect blend of alleles because the alleles have to match the environment. And if you can understand those three things, that genes exist, that they come in different flavors, and that different alleles are better suited for life in different environments, then you've got evolution in the bag. I pass on the alleles. They didn't help out my offspring. My offspring didn't reproduce anymore. That's the end of it. I all passed on these alleles. They did help my offspring. My offspring reproduced a whole bunch. The population slowly shifted in that direction because those are the alleles being passed around. That's basic evolution. Um, from that point, you'll probably get into the distinction between macroevolution and microevolution, which is a silly ass distinction to make in that context, but that's a different conversation. If you can understand those three things, you have evolution down pat from it's in, in, in its most basic fundamental form. That's it. Uh, so that's what I would go with. If, if if I was trying to present it to somebody who didn't believe it, that would be my evolution for dummies, so to speak. All right. Uh, that's that's awesome. I've heard you say those same things before. And I'm sorry. I <laughs> agree with all of them. Uh, no, 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 no. You, you, you're great. You're great. It, this, it's, it's okay. I, I just wanted clarification on this because I, I called in a couple of weeks ago t- and I talked to Jimmy Snow and, and Matt Dillahunty about it. And it it's, I'm basically trying to come to terms with the conclusion that I'm not going to change her mind. Her, she's set in her ways and she, and she's not going to change, but I still want to have that connection with my mom, you know, and, and I'm, there's other ways to, to do it. I mean, stuff. like, it, it, I understand, like, you know, my, 
I, I have family members who are, 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 you know, my in-laws who are very religious that don't even know that I'm an atheist. And, and like, I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to have those conversations because the, the absolute best case scenario there is that an old woman is very sad. Like that's, that's the best outcome. There, and, and there's a lot worse outcomes. As, uh, you know, so like, I'm just, it's not worth the time and effort. I can still have a relationship with that person. And I can still do whatever I can to make sure that person is happy and, and, and has a good experience with me. And like, that's fine. You know, uh, my wife isn't particularly into Dungeons and Dragons and the Lord of the Rings. I like those things a lot. It's not like I don't have a good relationship with my wife because we can't talk about that shit. We just have different opinions and we talk about other stuff that we do like together. So maybe this is just one of those things. Maybe she's just not into science and she's not into reality <laughs> and you find different stuff to talk about and that's okay. I, uh, yeah. at, the end of the, yeah. at the end of the day, I would focus a little bit more on wringing out every little bit of good experience that you can rather than trying to fix the bad experiences. But that's just me. Yeah, that that that's also why I wanted to talk to you because you're always so happy and you have a positive outlook on a lot of stuff and you've you've actually helped change my perspective on reality with your happiness. Nice, man. It's infectious. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I really did it's just want so to much talk to be about happy it. about, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. Life life is crazy and amazing and I love it. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have shit days. You are. And like how lucky you are that you get to recognize that those days are shit. If all your life was shit, you wouldn't even notice the difference. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, like, I, like, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's what uh, Bob Ross said. I, I need the, I need the dark times to know that I used to have the, the light times. Bob Ross is the only God we or, believe or, in on this channel. That, that's fair. <laughs> I love him and his pocket squirrel. Happy little trees. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you for answering my questions. Appreciate it. And uh, Matt, I, I hope you feel better. And Forrest, thank you. Keep being awesome. And uh, Jimmy, best. for listening, go fuck, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Fair. Thank you very much, man. Thanks, take care. All right. By the way, I'm this happy. And I'm still a nihilist to Steven. Just remember that. It's, it's okay. You can do both. That's just wild. I'm a happy nihilist. All right. So we got Chris in Wisconsin. Pronouncer he him has a question about uh, creationists and Damn evolution. It. Before you start, Hi. I'm so upset with myself right now. I, I'm a smilist. I'm a happy nihilist. I'm a smilist. I'm coining it right now. Put it on a t-shirt. That's my idea. I'm so mad I didn't say it earlier. I apologize for interrupting. <laughs> Ryan, please, please go ahead. Uh, I'm on, right? Yes, you You're are on. on. I'm just an asshole. Please continue. Right. My, my name's not Ryan, so I want to make sure. <laughs> oh, Chris, Chris is on. Uh, yeah, I, I, I said Chris, but Forrest inherited, I guess. I was looking at the wrong call screen. I'm also very dumb. Please ignore me and do your call. Cool. <laughs> so where I grew up, a lot of people are young earth creationists. And occasionally uh, when I was leaving the church and all, uh, we would talk about evolution and all these different things. And the hangout point that I seem to get stuck on, like where they would kind of have their objections was oftentimes I'm like the more big picture end of it, right? Like their questions would be, oh, well, how can the desire to love come about? Or how can this and that? It wouldn't be something specific like, oh, the gene mutation frequency don't match up or oh, this or that, right? And so mm -hmm. I was curious if, that's, if that lines up with kind of what you've experienced and everything that you guys do especially for us, I guess, because he's, uh, that's more his area. Um, is it, is it just like, specifically, you're saying like cre creationists trying to use specific weird phenomena in behavior as a way to say evolution doesn't explain X, Y, Z thing. Is that what you're saying? Well, I guess it's more like the kind of big picture idea of evolution versus the specific numbers of it, I guess is how I would put it. Like, is it someone, I'm not sure I understand. Because, like, the way that I might try and address the objections that people in my life would bring up would be to try and explain the basic thing. 
that you were, that you were talking about a moment ago, where it's kind of the basic idea of how something complex can come about just in a more abstract sense. Yeah. And I was wondering if that's what comes up most of the time, or if there's a lot of people who are also hung up on kind of specific parameters or more specific evidence, like mutation rates not being enough for this thing to happen. Yeah. Or it it like depends. That. In my experience, it depends on how into the actual science they are. Um, if they're just your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill, evolution, non-believer type person, then yeah, it's like, well, evolution can't explain this thing, or this thing makes no sense evolutionarily, or like maybe in an intermediate level, like it, it'd be like evolution can't explain consciousness, evolution can't explain love, evolution can't explain kin selection, evolution can't explain you know what the the our wonder and personalities and blah blah or something like that. That's like very very basic, uh, and they, they don't they just don't have a comprehension of what what is possible with biology um a little bit deeper than that you get into people who are like well uh you know this structure like look at the giraffe uh, they have valves in their neck to stop blood flow fast uh, going too fast to the brain and they have a rit mirable around the brain to to prevent you know too much blood and whenever they bend down to drink and like these are these are all specific adaptations that all have to be there together at the same time perfectly in order for the giraffe to exist and it's like that's okay. Now you've you've taken some time to study organismic biology and look at like what these animals are. You haven't taken the time to learn how evolution works, though, and so you're still in the same camp. Um, and then when you get people who are like professional evolution deniers, then you get into things where it's like, well, you know, if I uh, change this protein, then it's no longer functional in the same way, and therefore it can't possibly be the result of natural selection. It's like that. Now we're actually talking about the nuts and bolts of this, and also you're still wrong. Um, so it really <laughs> depends on who I'm talking to, I guess. It, 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 if on a call show like this, I wouldn't expect to have to talk about mutation rates or substitution rates or how proteins form or anything like that. Um, but I would expect to talk about, like, you know, do you really believe we came from a fish kind of thing? Or have you ever right, seen right. A, a, a um have you ever seen a dog produce a non dog that kind of thing like that I would expect that quite a bit um, if I was doing like an episode of Reacteria then I would expect to have more of a thing of like this has never been observed okay well yeah it has and also even if it hadn't we still see the effects and we we can find a mechanism without you trying to you know what I mean like let's actually get into what an argument actually is does that answer your question I feel like I I don't know if I breezed past it or if I covered it yeah I think so. I was curious okay, about because cool. uh, in my like in my very limited experience talking to people around me, uh, it's definitely more towards the start of that progression than the end of it. <laughs> Radical, so yeah, curious. yeah, that's yeah, that's 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 where it usually it, it depends on the format and the the venue and uh, the saddest for sure is when you're teaching public school students and they bring up things like this and you're like, yeah. I know for sure you did not come up with that argument at, like on your own. That's something from home. <laughs> Uh, I once had a, a kid at, at a, a public school tell me that evolution was a farce. And I was like, that's a really weird specific word that you used. And I can yeah, tell that your parents yeah. listened to Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, who says that evolution is a farce and has an acronym where the different letters mean different things about what's wrong with evolution. Like, there's no fucking middle schooler rocking around rural Oklahoma throwing around the word farce. That's not happening. <laughs> so, like... Yeah, it's, it, it really just depends on the, the audience and the context and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time. Sweet. Thanks for waiting, Chris. Thanks, much. Thanks for waiting All for right. so long. We have one more call. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Super Chats. Um, Sick. I, this is my fault because I really just wanted to have a show kind of basic generic science other stuff like that um but i didn't give that information to screener so who knows how this is going to go but jason oklahoma you're on with forrest and matt hello i'm hey, sorry you're in oklahoma <laughs> hey how y'all doing really good all right uh first i just want to give a quick shout out to all the smilers out there 
but We're pretty uh, cool. Yeah, if I could just uh, preface this before I get into, I want to be quick about it, with the whole, too. with the gender and science thing. I just want to say that when it comes to a societal standpoint, I li- I go by the live and let live, you know, code of things. As long as sure. everybody do does what they want, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. But when it comes to the uh, science but. side of things, I, I try to understand like what it comes down to. And that's where I kind of get lost in the weeds. Mm-hmm. Because when I hear people like, just to name a few, like Richard Dawkins and Brett Weinstein saying that things are, you know, like a binary. And then yeah. I hear somebody like Forrest, who I greatly admire, say it's a spectrum. Then, you know, I try to be skeptical of everything I hear, but, you know, like I said, that's just where I get kind of lost. So I'm trying to figure this out. So if I could just get some help with that, that'd be great. I I would say the major thing is that like the, a lot of the times when people really try to push this sex binary thing, it is almost exclusively. And I'm saying almost here, because there's no way I can possibly thoroughly properly represent this argument in the scope of the show right now. But like Mm -hmm. it is almost exclusively by glossing over outliers and, 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 you know, differences from the norm and things that don't comport with it or by just doing a rhetoric or a linguistic trick and saying, well, we only have two sexes that we've defined. So even if there is a continuum of variation between them, because we have two of them that we've named, that's two. And that's binary. And like, it's not hard to find actual scientific sources to talk about the, you know, spectrum of variation between the two sexes. And you can still say words like two sexes and not fall into the trap of thinking that this is a strict and unchangeable and, 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 you know, very parochial, narrow little binary that, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, the the mm-hmm. it, it, so it really it just comes down to a matter of like we talked about at the beginning of the show you know it's about putting facts in order the facts are that sex is a multivariate system with lots of different things that go into it not a single one of those things is solely determinate of the outcome and not a single one of those things has only two options if you can look at that and call it binary okay I don't think that's an appropriate use of the term. Um, you know, <laughs> binary for lack of a better word isn't good enough, and more than two isn't the same as two. So that's that's yeah. why I and others like me say this is very obvious. You can say it's mostly binary. You can say it's functionally it's binary. Bimodal. Off, yeah. You can say it's often binary, like things like that. It's it whatever. But if you're gonna sit here and say, yeah, it's 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 a binary, except for all the times that it isn't, like, I'm sorry, that's not that's not good enough for me. It's 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 the difference between po- common speech and and you know speaking professionally. But but setting all that aside, Jace, you're like, when I hear people like Dawkins or Brett Weinstein, well, first of all, when we're talking about gender, we're talking about a, as Arden would say, a durable psychological construct. But gender isn't merely gametes it's not biological sex gender as we're talking about it is at the intersection of biology sociology and psychology brett weinstein is not a biologist or a sociologist or a psychologist he's a covid 19 vaccine denying lunatic so i don't know why his name uh, came up at all dawkins is a biologist that gets even as forrest has pointed out recently even the specifics of the biology wrong while engaging in this equivocation fallacy what happens almost every time is either there's a no true scotsman fallacy where they say only cis women are women or there's an equivocation fallacy where they suggest that trans women are claiming to be cis women which they're not Uh, and by the way they always make it about trans women not trans men now they want to say oh it's trans ideology this look gender is I would say almost, but not quite, almost completely independent from biology. 
because the fact of the chromosomes, which I don't have access to somebody's chromosomes or the genitalia, I don't have access to their genitalia. It's none of my fucking business. But if somebody tells me their name is Steve and they're a man and their pronouns are he, him, I'm going to call them Steve and use he, him um, and refer to them as I would any other man. I don't care what was on their birth certificate. I don't care what their gametes are. I don't care what the biology is because we're no longer talking about anything that has anything to do with their biological makeup. We have something that has something to do with how they are uh, uh, view themselves in society and how they want other people to view themselves in society. And if you're truly in this, you know, hey, live and let live, then don't be worrying about what, Dawkins repeatedly fucking gets wrong while he, what we should be worried about is why is Dawkins wasting time propping up non-scientist right-wing talking heads who are anti-trans instead of engaging with actual scientists on any fucking subject that mattered. It's embarrassing. Yeah, I didn't know who that other guy was, but it, it sucks. And like, well, what I would throw out there also is that like, you know, this is not news. Yeah, I, I didn't touch on gender because I just wanted to get the sex thing out of the way because you were talking about that kind of thing and I, I figured that was whatever. But like the the distinction between sex and gender and and talking about gender as a, as a spectrum and like understanding that like, these are different things and that they're you know, this is like almost a hundred year old information now. Like I, I have and I'm not exaggerating here. I have five different college textbooks within arm's reach of me at this moment that talk about the difference between sex and gender and talk about how, you know, the, how, how fluid they are and how there's so many different options between the two of them and how neither of them is a, a binary state. Um, if I can very briefly, if I may be so bold, um, could I get full screen for a second? I'll just show you a screenshot here that I've, I've actually got a textbook pulled up on my computer here. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do display capture like this. And this is Campbell's biology concepts and connections this is a biology textbook made for like very early undergrads maybe even late high school right so this is the, just the very basic literally basic biology for all the people out there that love to throw that word around and here you can see in this paragraph right here we talk about uh, the biochemical physiological and anatomical features associated with males and females are turning out to be more complex than previously realized with many genes involved in their development we now know that sex is not a binary state with just two defined outcomes because of the complexity of the genes and proteins involved in sex termination many variations exist some individuals are born with intermediate sexual or intersex characteristics or even with anatomical features that do not match an individual's sense of their own gender known as transgender individuals sex determination is an active area of research that should yield a more sophisticated understanding in years to come now again that's pretty introductory and elementary but that's an introductory elementary textbook that's that that is a concept textbook meant to be given to people who are entering the field of biology so for all the people out there that love to say that this is some new woke ideology this is literal goddamn science that's been around for almost a hundred years now and like unfortunately there are still people out there that have made this a political thing or that are putting facts in a different order than the rest of us are and fuck it i guess they got podcasts to sell and get views on whatever but like at the end of the day th this is an area of active research that we're trying to get better at and talk about and yeah, that is going to involve a lot of like changes in our language and the way that we deal with each other, the same way that it was back when homosexuality was considered to be a mental disorder. And then all of a sudden we realized that it wasn't. Our information was updated and there were lots of psychologists running around saying, oh, this bullshit new ideology, this is clearly a mental disorder. All these people trying to say that it isn't. Oh my God. And then evidence prevailed and overnight millions of people were cured of a disease that they didn't have in the first place we just decided that wasn't a disease anymore so like that's exactly what we're seeing now trans people have always been here intersex people have always been here reality is what reality is and our attempts to draw little boxes around patterns that we see don't always work out and sometimes the boxes need to be redrawn but when reality doesn't fit into our boxes, that's our problem, not reality's problem. And that's exactly the kind of updating that we're doing today. Jay, so I'll give you one. I, I, yeah, I hope, I hope we've answered your question. If not, you can always call in the Transatlantic Call-In Show tomorrow. I'll give you one last 
minute here to to get a last thought in and then i got to move on to super chats yeah just uh wanted to say i'm sorry if uh bringing up either of those gentlemen uh was impolite or anything and as somebody no, not at all not at all didn't didn't go to college or anything and is completely unread on this subject i was just trying to figure out where was you know what's the right answer on this topic. that's that's, that's what the, they rely on so don't be ashamed of that so that's that's what people like that do is they say i am an expert in this field never mind the crazy shit that i say so just yeah, yeah that, that's that's fine but uh it anyways thank you both for the uh for the talk and uh i hope you all have a great week thanks jason i appreciate you listening i that's hope good. none of that sounded like us lecturing or talking down to you we were just sharing uh, we're Oh, good. All right. So we got super chats to go through. Uh, hey, do, do you have to leave or are you going to stay and do them with me? I'll stay and do super chats. Yeah. I just know you got no, work I'm to do go. and I don't. Oh, we, we ran Lord, really okay. long. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I got work it, to do too. It's a show with me. Of course, it ran long. <laughs> All right. So, boom, I got my list up. $10 for Sheridan Berlusconi. Ohio came through for women's rights. Uh, yeah, my understanding, I, I didn't get to talk about this. Issue one was to uh, change the requirements to uh, uh, from 50% plus one to 60% to uh, amend the Constitution. And something like that is an attempt to push the status quo, um, make it harder to change things from where they are. And given there's a fight there, uh, about abortion rights and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I really think I, I'm of two minds on this because I really think that constitutional amendments should be difficult and I would prefer like a 60 or 75% threshold to change it. But the fact of the matter is, is that to pass that now would codify the status quo and that's the only reason to do it. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much the long and short of it that I see with that as well as it was attempting to put a stifle on democracy. And it's like, if if you want to say that this is the way the constitution should be that's fine but if you're very quickly trying to make that the new rule it's a little bit telling you know what i mean yeah are we switching back right. and forth with the readings what yeah, are we doing go for it, go for it. okay 999 from bulldozer forest hi uh i really loved your video on coral reef restoration we always hear about the a terrible side of climate change for good reason but it's refreshing to hear what people are doing to combat it that's, I, I appreciate you watching the video and enjoying it. Um, everybody else should also go watch that video because it was a lot of fun to make and it's really fucking cool. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we still have to fight up an uphill battle. Right now, there is a major bleaching event going on off the coast of Florida yep. again because ocean temperatures are so very high. And I won't get into too many of the details. Go watch my video called uh, Cutting Up Coral for Science over on my channel. But, like, when those ocean temperatures change so dramatically... Coral lose their algal symbionts. They bleach. They're a lot of times they die. Even if they don't die, they're significantly more susceptible to disease. Like this destroys reefs, which are not just pretty to look at. They are vitally important for your life. You rely on coral reefs, no matter where you live in the world. So like we need to be protecting them and doing a better job. Save them. Um, people call the Amazon, the lungs of the planet. And that's bullshit. The ocean is the lungs of the planet. 80% of the oxygen you're breathing right now comes from the ocean. Well, unless I'm vaping, in which case, unless you're vaping, com comes from a Delta eight uh, derivative, but uh, nine, nine from Darren white. What's the best way to unwind during a busy stressful week? Catch a live stream before sharing his love of science. I really agree. I mean, that's awesome stuff. Uh, 10 theoretical dollars from D20. Forrest, right. how could AI potentially affect human evolution? Could the ability to solve a problem at a level humans cannot be a uh, gateway, to solve a problem at a level humans cannot be, I get it, uh, be a gateway to save us from our impending doom? Go fuck yourself. The thing about evolution is that it, it always requires selection pressure. So unless AI was, if AI is solving problems for us, radical. Um, but the actual thing driving evolution is selection pressure. Like if what things are causing us to reproduce more effectively or less effectively. So like there can be an indirect effect with that. For example, when we talk about like cesarean sections, you no longer have to fit a baby the size of a watermelon out of a cervix the size of a quarter all the time. And so because of that, humans are getting bigger and bigger heads 
because you don't have to worry about you know that fitting anymore. Uh, so that's modern medicine affecting human evolution. It's not applying a direct selection pressure. It's removing a selection pressure that was previously there. And you can see that in trends in like you know pelvis size, um, trends in human height as a result of increased uh, nutrition, things like that. So everything will inevitably affect human evolution a little bit, but I wouldn't take that as far as to say like AI will make us evolve this way. Just it will remove certain selection pressures and open up new ones and, and things like that. But it's, it's not predictable. Good question though. $10 from Sheridan Bernasconi. Another one. Thank you so much. According to Crayola, my hair color is silver. Forrest, what's your Crayola hair color? Hi, Matt. Mine's gray. You should have asked. I got a little bit. It's right there. Uh, <laughs> so it looks more red than it is in here because of the lights record. But if I put a thing over my head to block the light, it's like a very dark, very dark chocolatey brown kind of thing going on there. Uh, I don't know what you would call this. Shit brown? It's, it's shit brown. It's, it's lighter yeah, than that. It, it almost red appears in there. auburn. But it's anyway. whatever you call this, but also this at the same time. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to go find some crayons and see if I can find something with like reddish blonde highlights on shit brown. See what that is. I like it. <laughs> All right. This one's yours. Uh, 10 euros from Jordan. Uh, could we, uh, could we, with our current technology, even if it takes hundreds of years, use the building blocks of life and CRISPR to, or whatever other tool to create DNA or even a light form in the lab from scratch. Uh, yeah, totally. And that's already kind of already being done. Um, so we have not gotten to the point where we've been able to like just straight up make a cell from scratch, but we have gotten to the point where we've been able to like produce DNA more or less from scratch and then inject it into a cell which had its DNA extracted. And then that DNA repl uh, replicates in a cell. Uh, Craig Venter. I believe is the name of the scientist that's been working on that for a long time. And he made the first living organism to have its own website encoded into its DNA. Uh, he literally using, you know, the, the, the four letter code of DNA coded in a website and put it in, in a cell, took had a, a, a cell, extracted all the DNA from it, plugged this new DNA in the cell kept doing what cells do and replicated that DNA and divide it and everything like that. And he made a living organism with synthetic DNA with a website in it. Um, so like that's some shit that can happen. We're not at the point right now of literally, you know, you grab a box of protein and you grab some, some nucleosides and you sprinkle in a few, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 phospholipids and all of a sudden you have a cell. It's not, not quite there yet, but um, yeah, we are definitely well along that way. And it's really fucking cool, dude. We're probably moving towards a path to make my uh, my reptile breeding hobby um, redundant because so there's a company called Rare Genetics Incorporated that now can take sheds from snakes and test for well in October I think they're they're, they're expecting to have 34 uh, different ball python genes to test for right now it's like 17 or so but that's step one step two mm -hmm. is getting their um, their genome repository there so that everybody sends them in a, a snake shed. They, they log that so that even if you only got one test, if they develop other tests later, you don't have to send them a new shed. You're already in the system. They can just, you know, run that for the rest of it. Cause they will have, they will have sequenced this, but at some point we can get to, to a point where you can just say, I would like a ball Python and I would like it to have these three recessive traits and these five, uh, incomplete dominant traits. And you push a button and it just genetically, uh, produces the manipulates the egg so that you get that particular snake uh, that'd be sick. science fiction -y, but someday fifty dollars holy macaroni thank you so much a new creed thank you so much forrest i've been wanting to go back to school for biochem genetics i've been horrified because i was raised in anti-education religion and struggling with math uh, i love learning it all so much you've been inspirational thanks that is awesome Thank you so much for going back to school and for wanting to learn and for your kind words here. That's that's all incredibly sweet. You're going to be great. I, I You're going to be a great scientist. I, I think I should get like at least 20% of the credit because I put together a show about trying to inspire people in science and I brought in the right person to inspire you to get hey. involved in science. I think, you know, <laughs> 15% we'll go with. 
ten dollars from Diane Upshaw. Uh, just glad to have a day off to be here. Uh, nothing witty to say. Carry on. Day off sounds really nice. I was uh, dissect. I was working in a cadaver lab today, so I spent like about four hours or five. Hours. I spent several hours cutting up a dude. And then came home and took a shower really quick and then sat down and immediately started this show. <laughs> so, like it's a, Oh, man, a day off sounds really good. <laughs> How did we make it three hours before I found out that you spent hours in a cadaver lab today? I got, <laughs> I got so many more questions, but we don't have time to go through all those uh, questions there. 10 euros from Yordam. Are there future problems in the shifted selection pressure among humans due to medical advancements? Couldn't a lot of health problems spread among people so everyone needs to be treated? Yeah, so this was a thing that um, like several people have brought. Even Darwin uh, talked about this um, uh, in, in a, it, a very close to eugenicsy kind of argument. He was talking about like you know if we continue treating everybody and and making sure everybody has a right to live, then eventually undeniably del deleterious traits will spread in the population. And even though he did come to the conclusion at the end that like at the end of the day, this is undoubtedly the right thing to do like this is for sure the way that we should progress as humanity um you know it, it, it's one of those things that people get really concerned about the issue is he didn't think that through all the way either <laughs> um the thing about like fixing these problems is, is is you know reproduction is like okay well we can fix you but like your genes still say this that or the other thing but at the end of the day the selection pressures that would have made us call those things problems aren't there anymore either. There's a reason why I didn't have to run away from lions on the way home from, to, from work today. You know what I mean? Because that wasn't an issue for me. That selection pressure has been removed. So yes, we will be shifting selection pressure with different medical advancements that will both create and destroy selection pressures that we have around us today in the same way that access to increased nutrition, agriculture, um, air conditioning, um, you know, uh, uh, control of wild animals, like all of these things have created and destroyed selection pressure. It is always a net positive. Um, it's unpredictable as to what it'll actually do to our phenotype, um, but uh, we can start tracking trends as soon as we start paying attention. So yeah, it's a good thing. Is this when you or me, I've lost track. I don't, I don't even remember. $10 from games and science. Uh, as someone who is centered around science-based content, I let people know I'm not an expert in any field. I just really like to read. It'd be dishonest for me to pretend otherwise. Yeah, that's I, I never call myself an expert in anything either. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a second master's degree right now. I, I, I'm not going to call myself an expert in anything because I know the shit that I don't know. If I was studying one single thing for 50 years, then maybe I'd throw that word around. But like, I... I I just like to tell people the things that I know and encourage them to go find out more things. I, I don't know. It's really I, easy I, for I me. Sorry, I, go ahead. I, I have no I have no credentials, no degree. It's really easy for me to say I'm not an expert in anything because it, it's obvious to everybody I'm not an expert in anything. Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm a lot more comfortable with the word scientist than the word expert. I feel like the word expert carries a weight of responsibility, whereas the word scientist just means I'm learning the shit. You know what I mean? Anybody who's learning the shit is a scientist. Um, but to say an expert, you have to know the thing <laughs> like really well. I hear you. 10 euros from Yellow Banana. Hey, Forrest, can you please? Oh, my gosh. Hey, Forrest, can you please explain, explain endogenous retroviruses? Is, is it alone a sufficient proof for evolution or part of the package of evidence? If so, what's a go-to topic when debating evolution? Thank you. Okay, but we're not going to spend it, an hour on this. Yeah, okay, okay. really quickly, uh, an endogenous retrovirus, what we're talking about here, class six viruses, otherwise known as retroviruses, they have this really cool thing called reverse uh, polymerase, or sorry, reverse transcriptase, reverse polymerase. Pfft, that's dumb as shit. And if you like genetics, you'll know why. Um, that's this thing called reverse transcriptase. And what it does is it, uh, it, it takes the viral genome, the viral DNA, and it literally puts it into your DNA. So even if you eradicate every single viral cell, your DNA is still the virus's DNA a little bit, and it's encoding for these viruses to be continued to produ produce. This is why HIV is so scary and so hard to uh, fix, because HIV is a class six virus, it's a retrovirus, um, and so it puts its DNA in your DNA, and that's why it fucking sucks. Um, so there are some examples of where endogenous retroviruses have affected our evolution. A great example of that is the fact that humans uh, uh, tend to have placentas. Um, and you're producing a child, um, you have this cool placenta situation going on. Um, the, the, the condition of doing that 
is the result of a viral infection that caused this weird invagination of tissue that we ended up just rocking with um, and, and utilizing. And that's where you get a split between monotremes, marsupials, and placentals uh, 120 million years ago. Um, and there's a bunch of other cool examples. So like it, it is an evidence of evolution, but it's not like a necessary factor of evolution, nor is it the entire sufficient proof of all of evolution. It's just a cool fucking thing that happened over the course of evolutionary history. Hope that's enough information because I don't want to talk anymore about it. We got to keep moving. Um, um, 100 sexes. Oops. Oh, you took it away. Swedish crown. It's gone. 100 sexes from uh, Philip Granberg. Forrest, hi. Uh, can you talk a bit about the correlation between perception and uh, uh, perception and metabolism? Between time perception and metabolism. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. I don't. I don't know what that like. Okay, so metabolism is a very big word, and it's just the sum total of the chemical processes in your body. And so, yeah, time perception plays into that. Is going to be a part of that. And anybody who doesn't believe that should go smoke pot and experience time dilation as your the THC is metabolized. Um, so, like, but as far as like the actual correlation between the two. I don't think I have anything intelligent or meaningful to say besides the fact that there is one. <laughs> um, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't really have anything off the cuff about it. Uh, I can look something up for later, let, I guess. Let, let me, before YouTube comes to, to kill us all, let me say that Forrest is making a suggestion for people who are of the appropriate age in areas where the, the, the particular pharmaceutical is legal. Yes. Don't don't do science unless it's legal in your area and prescribed by a doctor. Ten dollars for most Scoville snake snake egg. Yeah, I got lots of snakes oh. and lots of eggs. I understand what the person was asking now. Okay, uh, it's it's the 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 fact that uh, animals with a larger size and slower metabolic rate tend there's empirical evidence that they experience time more slowly. I didn't know what they meant. I just looked up what they were talking and I saw this thing coming up here there's a few articles about it. i get what you're saying yeah yeah it's it's why like flies when you try to swat a fly and it seems to know your next move it's literally experiencing time slower than you you're moving slower you know when they have giants and cartoons and they're all real slow and dumpy that kind of actually tracks <laughs> because like if you have a larger body size you have a slower metabolism and uh you would be more likely to experience time in a slower fashion um and also have less risk of cancer which is really cool. Lower metabolic rates also have a co direct correlation to lower cancer risk. Um, there's a lot of cool things with that. Uh, I don't know as far as like the neuroscientific side of it about like the actual perception of time and how that works. Um, that's not my area of expertise, so I wouldn't speak to it. Um, but if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that it's the same kind of cool ass pleiotropy as the cancer thing. Just genes be gene and and it makes some really neat into uh, 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 effects. That's what I would assume. Again, nothing off the cuff here. This is just some shit that I, <laughs> I don't have anything prepared. Basically, you're just saying I experience time differently from you. Oh, it's because because I'm more massive. Uh, Ten dollars from Dvosky. Thanks, Forrest and Matt, for the great show today. This one is for Forrest. I'm in Tulsa right now visiting a friend of mine. Do you have any food joints, restaurants you'd recommend, and some place to go? Yeah, so I live in Tulsa. And it's fucking. It's a great place if you like bad places. Um, go to a Fat Guys Burger Bar and get yourself a peanut butter bacon burger. Peanut butter bacon burger, so good. Um, throw on some fucking grilled pineapple and some some green chilies on there it's so good dude uh you can order it way they call it thai style it's got like jalapenos and sriracha and shit uh or my favorite also black and blue burger they put blue cheese and like black and uh, cajun seasoning also with grilled pineapple and green chilies though and some mushrooms oh yeah that guy's burger bar uh it will you'll hear your arteries slamming shut but it is so very good and so very worth it also memories of japan Reasonably priced sushi in the heart of Broken Arrow, which was actually my hometown. Uh, Twenty dollars, twenty Australian dollars, or Armenian dollars, or Argentinian dollars, or Albanian dollars. Uh, from I don't know. From uh, PhD Tony, thank you for your cogent 
uh, uh, trenchant and sustained efforts to drive back the forces of will for ignorance and associated immorality. Love the phrasing there. Very cool. Thanks so much, Tony. Uh, this is Argentina. Argentina pesos, 2,000 okay. Argentine pesos from Dernurio. Hey, Matt, do you, do you know any Rene LeVon card tricks? Uh, yeah, but I do them with two hands. Actually, I don't do any of them anymore, but uh, I, I love Rene, um, or loved. Uh, it's just, I remember the first time I, I saw him uh, doing It Can't Be Done Any Slower, and uh, I already did a, a version of Oil and Water, but there's nothing that, that really compares to, to that. Um, even though I did versions with four and five cards for each color, but, uh, his is still better. Oh, I know some magic. Anything about that? That do anything for you? Not yeah. a thing. But it's, it's whole now. Uh, $10 from Sal Willis. I want to ask you both your thoughts on reconciling a secular humanist value system with deep, deep feelings of misanthropy, asking for a friend, much love. <laughs> You don't oh, that's have to easy. like people to treat them with respect. That's exactly it. Um, yep. I, you, you can ask Arden, um, how many times do I say I fucking hate people? The thing is, I One can thing. hate individual people in a misanthropic sense and still love and care about humanity and value them all. Uh, I frequently find myself hating individual people while still caring about humanity. Most definitely. And I, I will still afford all of those people I despise. I still afford them all their rights and their dignity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way the man, that is a common argument. I live talking about like basic human rights. And when I talk about why I oppose the death penalty, when I talk about prisons and the, like, what about some rapist, some pedophile, some murderer? Don't Joe is like, yeah, they're a human being. If, if, if you, you don't have to put any qualifications, are they a human being? Yes. Then they deserve human rights. And that's, that's the whole thing. I'm not going to be as shitty as them. Um, it's uh, twenty dollars from Silence uh, uh, Terrapod. Uh, Forest, what is? What did I say? Terrapod. Oh yeah, you're right. It's Tetrapod. I'm reading too fast. From Silent Tetrapod. Um, Forest, what is your favorite organism that is usually seen as a pest, but is actually very important to the ecosystem? Possums. Possums, y'all. Don't hurt them. They're great. They're wonderful little dudes, and it's insanely difficult to be hurt by one. Not only are they just generally not vile, they're all bark, no bite. They'll sit there and snarl and whatever, but then they'll just fall over dead. It's super, di they can bite, super difficult to get bitten by one. Also, they're immune to most, most zoonotic diseases. They, they can't have rabies. Well, they can have rabies. It's exceedingly rare for them to have rabies because their body temperature is so low that the virus can't propagate. They're immune to Lyme disease. They're immune to rattlesnake venom. How fucking wild is that? Because they make venom neutralizing peptides in their blood. They're just chill guys that do good work ecologically, and they deserve to be around, and they're nice, so be good to them. Also, beetles. Any beetles that people see in their houses... Uh, like beetles do 80% of the pollinating on this planet. Leave the fucking beetles alone. Put them outside. And spiders. If you have a spider in your house, you know what you don't have? A bunch of other shit that you don't want in your house because the spider's already eaten them. And snakes. See, when somebody says, they, what's your favorite organism, you don't get to list four. <laughs> Sorry. I get excited. I just I love know. them, man. If, if they're so sweet. I, I have a picture of me with an Australian possum that was very sweet, but the possums here in the United States, I had a run in with one that got underneath my car and sat there and growled at me and would not let me get in my car and, and, and even chased me a little bit, which is weird, but not for long, because a couple of feet just to get me out. Um, yeah, yeah. A little charge I, I at think, you. I, I think I'd go with armadillos because uh, yeah. I think they're underutilized because armadillos give birth to identical, identical quadruplets and mm -hmm. they're, um, uh, immune to but carry leprosy and so the and identical quadruplets makes them great for scientific experimentation and they're adorable they're so they goddamn cute so smelly so smelly but so cute twenty dollars as things called kevin them turtle rabbits turtle rabbits twenty dollars kevin o'kelly my favorite example of consciousness being from the brain comes from the case of phineas gage so fascinating yeah, that's that's the one that we usually bring up. Like it, anybody who has ever learned anything about neuroscience ever has talked about and learned about Phineas Gage, um, because it was literally the beginning of that that study. Um, for those who don't know, 
I'll be very succinct. Very, very. This is a guy in the old West who was helping build a railroad through a mountain and there was a dynamite accident and there was an explosion and it blasted a red hot steel rod through this guy's dome and just obliterated his frontal lobe and cauterized everything on the way out so that he was able to walk out of the mine having his brain just completely he was literally lobotomized instantly um and he went to the doctor and the doctor was like yeah walk it off go back to work tomorrow and he did and whereas this person was kind polite hardworking sober honest good dude after his frontal lobe was destroyed he was violent cruel sexually uh, uh, um, uh, predatory um uh, egotistical lazy um and that was the beginning of the study of, of neuroscience really because they realized oh shit this part of the brain was who this person was and clearly that mattered and it did something that changed and so like that was yeah it's one more of those big lines of evidence that show that consciousness is a, a emergent property of the brain, not some fucking field that our brain is an antenna for. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, 999 from John Kennel. My confidence in scientific proclamations is always improved by clickbait ads about celebrity scandals and <laughs> miracle toenail fungus cures. That's man. You know, I remember talking about this the first time with a friend of mine, Dr. Gordon Walker. He does a channel called Fascinated by Fungi. And we were talking about like fads and diets and things like that. And we were yeah. like, you know, it's, it, it's uh, if you try to sell a diet book that's, you know, one sentence long that says, try to eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can and exercise whenever it's possible. But uh, inevitably, it really comes down to genetics. You're not going to sell a million copies of it, but you will sell a million copies of the one that says if you eat exclusively turtle dicks, you'll lose a thousand pounds and learn to fly. And like, that's the one that'll make the headline news. It's like, yeah, it's, it sucks. And uh, by the way, lots and lots of turtles are protected. Uh, you can't, as somebody who keeps reptiles uh, in Texas, there's very few turtles that you're allowed to keep at all. And we nearly uh, made some of them extinct, making soup out of them. I don't know if we were eating their dicks or not, but uh, it didn't do anything That's, for our health. Or... That protection of turtles is why there's an obesity epidemic today. It's that you should eat the turtle That's dick. That's exactly diet. it. We're all fat because we stopped eating turtle dick. $20 from Ken Langley. Thank you so much, Ken. If, and thanks for if the If anybody brevity. clips anything from this show, let it be that. <laughs> Uh, ten dollar. Uh, 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 Moyet Morgan sent a super chat with a sticker. Yay! I'm sure it was a very cool sticker. Thank you very much for sending uh, it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Moyet. Was it the one with the cat doing the thing? Because I thought I saw that come up in the chat a little while ago. I saw one come up, but uh, it, it was a little bit. Yeah, there was the cat one, but I think that one's later. Uh, I'm pretty sure that one was like a video game controller with cool, like those, you know, those glasses that like it's like a meme. They'll come onto someone's, they'll slide onto someone's yeah, face from yeah, the yeah. screen. It was those glasses. Ah, yes, hell yeah. Ten dollars from Gray Mage. Thank you so much, Gray Mage. Um, two hundred and ten noaks uh from gold underscore h. Hey Forrest, hi. Um, I think the theme of poop transplants and the effects of gut health is very interesting. You've talked about the effects on mice. Um, what do we know about the effects on humans or if it's at all a safe procedure? Um so what he's talking about here is uh floor. you have a micro yeah, yeah, you have a microbiome, a, a microflora in your in your gut. Um, you have all these you know bacteria and fungi and cool little things living inside your intestines, and they play a major role in the way your metabolism works, in your you know, the way you deposit and maintain fat and things like that. Um, and so the the experimentation on mice that I've talked about before is you can raise mice in a completely sterile environment where they have no bacteria in their guts, take poop from other mice that have been raised in different environments and literally put it in the mice, in the sterile mice and the sterilized mice will take on the physical attributes of the mice from whom they received the poop. If they got it from an obese mouse, you now have these bacteria that are really good at like storing fat and like, or, 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 or you know, extracting extra nutrients and your body's going to store a lot of fat. I should clarify the bacteria, are not the ones storing the fat, the bacteria, are the ones helping to extract nutrients. Um, and vice yeah. versa, you can have a, a really athletic mouse give you the poops, and then you have a, a, a poop having felt mouse. Uh, as far as humans are concerned, there I'm ninety nine percent sure there actually are places that do this. Um, it's just like not a thing that's just like 
commonly done. I don't know for sure what actual human trials have been done, what research has been done. Dr. Ben's on this channel. He'll know uh, what the actual details of it are. But uh, uh... as far as I know, it is a real thing uh, that is sometimes done in humans. I can look it up right now to be safe, though. My ex-wife is a microbiologist, and she told me about this ages ago. And we used to joke um, because she was always on the hunt to find one of those wonderful yet freakish people who can eat whatever the fuck they want and stay incredibly thin. And she was like, I'm going to get their poop and put it in a milkshake so that I can eat whatever I want and stay incredibly yep. thin. Um, yep. So for all and of I you people with a particular um, kink, I imagine if you hooked up with uh, with the people right who could eat whatever they want and remain thin, you could use that for weight loss, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I just double-checked, and I, like I said, I was 99% sure this was done to humans, but I didn't want to be talking about medical shit. Just, so I just double-checked, and yes, fecal transplants uh, can be performed in both children and adults. Research shows that fecal transplants can restore healthy bacteria in the lower intestine and help control C. diff, all sorts of cool things. That's from John Hopkins here. Um, but yeah, stool transplants, fecal micro, fecal, fecal, oh my God, fecal microbiota transplants, FMTs. Um, they work in, in patients that need them. They're a thing that can happen. So go find your athletic friend and ask them for a very weird favor and, uh, <laughs> don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't do it that way. Cause that's how you get Giardia. Um, $20 from Nymaz. It depresses me so much that there's no proof of the connection between the physical brain and consciousness that I'm going to go drink myself silly. Yep, that's how it works. <laughs> you don't know where the consciousness <laughs> comes from, <laughs> and now you're a nihilist, and you go fucking die weirdly. Go drink myself silly. That I, I got to admit, Nymaz, that's got to be the cleverest super chat of the day. I, 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 I love it. <laughs> all right 20 dollars from cyber kid matt thanks for the entertainment on twitch both of you gentlemen are phenomenal and i appreciate what you both do thank you so much cyber kid are you the person that i banned today because i ban i banned several people every day which is why there's only ever like 30 people watching me on twitch uh because uh, I'll, I'll play the games i'll talk about stuff and everything else but i'm also an asshole uh evidently and and have major problems because people will come into my twitch stream and their first chat will be you should do this. And I'm like, if you just walked into somebody's house, is that the first thing you'd say to them? How about, <laughs> I am so-and-so. By the way, are you taking questions? Somebody came into my Twitch chat the other day and said, um, please explain your position on blah, blah, blah. That was their very first chat. Not hi, not hey, are you taking questions? I'm sitting here getting some Counter-Strike practice in in preparation for CS2 to try to get back some of the skills I had 23 years ago. Not going that well. And somebody decided right off the bat, please explain your position on this. No, uh, I'm not a fucking Absolutely performing not. monkey boy. How about you pay me? And then I'll interrupt my game to you. Know, right. I thought about starting a Twitch channel. If I ever have some free, like you can watch me edit something. Like if I edit my videos and you can watch me watch the same 10 second clip 50,000 times to get the timing just right. I do. Uh, I do a lot of, I do my searches for snake stuff on there. Um, shopping for deals on morph market, Craigslist, et cetera. Sometimes I'll go through Craigslist and look at people who are selling reptiles and just basically roast them. You know, that's a shitty enclosure. Oh, you're still using one of those round analog uh, thermometers that are fucking useless and should not be allowed to be sold. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll rip on them for that stuff. That's excellent. Uh, $10 from Monkey at Typewriter. Smileism, because it doesn't matter if you sm <clears throat> because it doesn't matter if you smile. Love that. Great show, guys. Y'all are part of my decision to go into education. That's awesome. Starting a master's in teaching in the fall. That's fantastic. Great show. Thank you so much. So happy to hear there are more teachers out there getting started. That's awesome, dude. That is great. 999 from Nuzzy D. Thank you, Matt, for my daily dose of philosophy and critical thinking. Thank you, Forrest, for making me laugh while feeling very dumb. Stay awesome and y'all go fuck yourselves. That is, I I, I love just the, the, the niceness and the thank yous. It's, it's very sweet. I, I got sick, literally, stomach stuff, and it's been rare. I've been, I've been, I'm, I'm dealing with some health issues, but nothing to worry about right now. But, um, yeah, I, I hate talking about my health stuff because people know I've had open heart surgery and I've got diabetes and I, like, oh my God, I don't want advice. I'm not looking for, I don't want any unsolicited medical advice, nothing like that. Um, 
this could probably just something I ate, but like five minutes before we went live, my stomach decided to uh, yell and scream and throw a fit. I've been fine throughout the rest of the show. I'm sure I'll be fine later. Um, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> Ten dollars from Nathan Miffy. Smileism, because if you uh, if you have the power to smile with nihilism, you have a power greater than a god. A concept made up by people who undervalue others uh, could possibly give you. Love you guys. Love the show. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Love that. Thanks, Nathan. Nineteen ninety nine uh, from Greg Markowski. So band practice tonight. Can't wait to watch the show tomorrow. You're going to enjoy it, and you weren't first in, but that's cool because I like getting the. Uh, the last minute stuff. Much appreciated, Greg. It gets real weird. 99 from Jamnico6. Uh, I'm adding Forrest Smilist to the list of terms that help describe me, along with misanthropic and humanist. Matt, what's the word you coined and combined consequentialism and foundationalism? I did not coin the term. Um, Susan Hawk is a philosopher, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name. It's foundherentism, that is the combination of foundationalism and coherentism. Um, I, I would love, I, it would be a great honor, I might even get a little starstruck to be able to sit down and do an interview with Susan about this, um, because I don't, think, I don't think it's gotten anywhere near the attention it deserves. I came up with the idea in, in the roughest form on my own and went looking for this and found her and coherent, I found herentism. So nice. she, she's, I don't, I, I'm almost most of sort of afraid to meet her and get to know her because she could turn out to be terrible. And then I would be disappointed by yet another person, but right. Don't meet your heroes. Uh, $10 from Denver Arnold in some thousands, hundreds of thousands of years or more, could some animals adapt to the microplastics in their physiology? I don't know if you asked me, like, if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say no, because they're not, you know, digestible and, like, consumable, but, like, that's not or organic. crazy. Like, yeah, why well, other animals use, like, inorganic materials to make things, to do stuff, but, like, I don't know, man. Although, it, 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 we, we have the ability, like, when you get a splinter or a thistle, your body has the ability to basically force that out and push it out over time. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's impossible that your body couldn't do something similar with microplastics. I think the sheer size of them and the prevalence of them would make that impossible. Yeah. It'd be impossible to keep up with. As of right now, every single person in the United States eats about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Every week you consume about a credit card's worth of plastic. It's in the food. It's in the salt. It's in the the drinks. It's in the it's everywhere. It's ever got. We found microplastics in fucking fetuses. Um. So like, yeah, just it's it's all over, dude. And I don't think with the rate at which we're consuming it that it's possible for our bodies to keep up with getting rid of. That's it. why maybe, we need maybe. to eat more. We need to eat more Teflon and credit cards. Just eat the credit card straight, and that way, <laughs> I don't know. Save you money. <laughs> Me and my human sent a $50 super chat sticker, and that is awesome and much appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we only got a handful left, but I, I'm, I'm genuinely overwhelmed and overjoyed, especially since you guys are my Wednesday therapy. So, <laughs> $10 from Homespun Covers. Can you make a video? Uh, sorry, can you expect making a gnome in the future as simple as 3D printing is today? I wonder if that's genome. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just 3D print a genome. Maybe. Yeah, fucking yeah, dude. For sure then. <laughs> yeah, I was like, why wouldn't you just 3D print a gnome? <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, I, was no, like, I can totally a, see Like that. a garden gnome to put out? I can already yeah, do that. Exactly. I got 3D yeah. printer down the hall. I can fucking make one right Fuck now. yeah. <laughs> put a million of them. Yeah, no, uh, for sure though. Yeah, you could totally, eventually down the line, I could totally see that being may, maybe not exactly as simple as that, but honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if it was exactly as simple as that someday. <laughs> so this is $10 super chat from Alan Ferguson, but there's a follow-up here, which is $10 from Alan Ferguson coming out for the third time. First is gay. Second is atheist. Now as LSD user for depression, atheist was the hardest. Why? Um, Societal pressure. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to diminish anybody coming out as, as, as gay because for a lot of people, it's 
one of the most traumatic things that they've ever had to do. Um, by the way, Wayne Brady, um, who some of you know from whose line is it anyway, and a number of other things, came out as pansexual uh, just this week um, and, and that, yeah. gave a really uh, sweet interview talking about you know, how difficult it was for him to identify, you know, figuring, finding out the right label. And for him, it, it's pan. Um, yeah. But I think I remember um, Jen Peoples, one of my former co hosts on the other shows. Um, when they came out as an atheist, it was a bigger deal because when they came out as gay, everybody was like, yeah, we already know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I remember hearing that from a number of different people. Um, so congratulations on, on coming out, uh, uh, for the third time. Although I'm pretty sure coming out as somebody who, who's an LSD user for depression, uh, carries virtually no stigma. So that, that's probably going to be the easiest, uh, but I appreciate your contributions there, Alan. Thank you so much. Love that. Yes, yeah, that I, what Wayne Brady was saying about sexuality and everything like that. It's, it's I I loved. I didn't see the interview. I just read some of it from like NPR, and I, it's, it, he was saying that like you. I think this is the best way to describe it, and I've been thinking about it for a while. And I like he was even in. It seemed like there was some trepidation to make sure that he was using the right words. And like I I get that. You know what I mean? That's. I always just say I'm I'm as straight as I need to be. I'm in a heterosexual marriage. That's all you need to know about it if you need to know anything. The details, I'm not going to sit here and dig, and dig into it. You know what I mean? Because I don't I don't know the words. I don't know the I don't know the gay words, and I don't want to use them wrong. <laughs> hey, it's it's one of those things where, uh, so I I know people who will uh, say they're queer because they're in a relationship with someone who's queer. And mm -hmm. I can't do that. It, it actually makes me a little, I'm a little pissed off about it. I've mentioned it before. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what label fits me and generally I don't care. But even if I felt yeah. like I was queer or pan, um, I don't know that I'd use those terms because I don't feel like I did anything to earn those terms. I know people who have gone through so much just to be able to say, I'm gay, I'm a lesbian, I'm trans, mm -hmm. I'm queer. And to whatever extent any of those labels might apply to me, I didn't go through shit. That, that and, is precisely how I feel, dude. That's precisely how I feel. I, I, I don't want to take anything from the LGBT community by throwing around words that don't necessarily apply to me or that I misunderstood. Yep. And I, you know what I mean? It's just, it's not worth it. I'm for all intents and purposes. I am a cis straight white man. I don't need to fucking, you know what I mean? I'm just here. I've had it handed to me and I don't need to de you know, complicate it at all. It's not anybody's problem anyway. See, so yeah, I don't, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Yeah. No, I, I, I love that you said that because I have, I got enough people telling me I'm gay anyway. What, what difference would it make? <laughs> Right, but it's, this one's yours. Sure, I my my wife's favorite answer whenever anybody talks about my sexuality, she's like, "Are you sleeping with him? If not, <laughs> does it really matter to you?" Look, deal. Uh, Ten dollars from Chris uh, Cardiero. Um, I discovered this channel from the video where the guy said he had a sexual relationship with God. <laughs> I remember that video. Um, nevertheless, you all have helped me immensely on my deconstruction journey. Thankful for all of you. We're thankful that you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Carriero, Chris. I'm assuming is the name, but I, if I'm mispronouncing it, send another $10 super chat to tell me that I said it wrong. <laughs> wow. And meanwhile, Cyber Kid, uh, after... <clears throat> Another chipping 20. in earlier for the Twitch thing chips in another twenty bucks. Say no, I wasn't banned on Twitch. I'm Commander Two Hundred Nine on there again. Thank you both. Thank you. I, I Everyone, go subscribe to Commander Two Hundred Nine. Um, Twitch. Also, Jimmy Snow is in the chat. God help us all, and is uh, right. is talking about he knows all the gay words. Uh, he says is having heterosexual sex gay. Of course it is. It's very gay for a man to have sex with a woman because women like dick, and that's gay as hell. <laughs> That's, it's a very gay thing to do. Yeah, who, who was that guy, honey? Who was that? Who? Who's that Nazi jackass that was saying sex is gay, all sex is gay? Oh, is that an actual oh, thing? Oh, uh, Nick Fuentes. Nick Fuentes. Yeah, yeah. Said, no. 
Oh yeah. This is a bit that I've been doing for and someone actually said that. Yeah, no, no, no. He, that that's Nick Fuentes. Good job. I was like the other day I was having sex with my wife and I looked down and saw my own dick and the whole thing got way too gay. <laughs> Fucking so stupid, dude. Oh, that's great. Um, ten dollars from Denver Arnold. I was thinking something along the line of mollusks, which, if I recall right, use minerals in their shell. Yeah. Uh, so there's actually. Oh, let me see here. Um. Oh, let me see if I can find him because these guys look fucking cool. There is a shell. It's called the a shell, a uh, scaly foot gastropod. Everybody go look up scaly foot gastropod. Uh, It is a deep sea snail that incorporates iron into its fucking shell. It has a goddamn suit of armor. And it's this sick ass black and red looking dope fucking sea snail with big crazy antennae. Uh, And it's cool as fuck. And I love it. So yeah, this is a a, a snail that uses iron to make its shell. It's so fucking cool. I I get one. Oh, they're awesome. They're also known as volcano snails, I think. Oh, and that's cool because they look like that. All right. This is the final super chat of the night. Unless somebody else gets one in. And if you don't, you're going to be giving the the last word to Jimmy Snow. $9.99 from Jimmy Snow. Wow, a show with Forrest going late. Who's have guessed? I'm going to go with who who have guessed. But thank you, Jimmy. He said who's. and go fuck yourself. Um, yeah, no, it is. To- it is called a volcano snail. I just I was, look up the volcano. Everybody, go do that. That's your homework for the night. Go look up volcano snails on on the Googleies. They're really cool. Jimmy, you need to come over and hang out, especially since uh, we're going to be heading out of town before long. Uh, yeah, let me hit this up real quick. Obviously, uh, right now the plan uh, for next week is for me to have um, Mindshift Skeptic on. Uh, I will try to confirm that. If that doesn't happen, there's a chance that next week's show won't happen because Arden and I are are basically leaving um, uh, to do stuff uh, and, and see people. And there's some overlap, and I'll I'll talk more about it afterwards. Um, I've got uh, I've got guests arriving here at the house who are going to be here for the next couple of weeks, which is great. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, especially since there's so much going on because we have, uh, here, I'm a, I'm a pull up husbandry pro, which is where I track all of our snake stuff. Um, in the meantime, thank I you so much, Chris Carrillo for sending out another super chat to let me know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> is there really you, one? Forrest. I was going to put that up right when he did that. So thank you. <laughs> thank no you. Worries. So when I go over to Husbandry Pro, which is the application that I use for tracking all of our snake stuff, I have a little chart here with everything that's in the incubator. We are literally on day 51 of 56 for six Python, ball Python eggs from our Mojave Calico Het Pied or possible Het Pied to our Leopard Het Pied or possible Het Pied, which means on the 14th, today's the 9th, on the 14th, we've got six eggs that are hatching. On the 18th, there's five more. On the 19th, there are 18 corn snakes that are going to be hatching. On the 21st, there's 12 more ball pythons. On the 15th of September, there's eight more. On the 21st of September, there's four more. On the 27th, there's seven more. And there's still two more girls in there that have yet to give us eggs that we're waiting on. We're doing uh, hangouts and stuff on uh, go and look up Epic Loot Exotics. I'm going to be doing some teaching uh, on snake genetics and breeding and what our breeding uh, plan is going to be for next year. Forrest, thank you for three and a half awesome hours i know you had work to do we we just kind of chucked this together without a moment's That's hesitation right. uh you got a show coming up here on monday so yep. everybody come back on monday um and hang out with forrest and get better answers to all the questions you didn't get answered today hopefully we get some cool creationist colors although i believe that we probably won't because we never get them on that show they just don't want for some reason the Christians and the creationists just don't want to talk to two actual biologists who study the science they don't think is real. It's weird. Just for some yeah. of the, the calls just drop off. They'd rather just use a partial quote from Darwin and pretend right. like they did anything that was close to science. 
on that front, thanks everybody for hanging out this weekend and a huge thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, your financial donations are wonderful, helping to work to build up the line network, like, and subscribe. You can also go over to patreon.com where we are building up uh, support so that we can get uh, podcasts of the shows and do line con next year in conjunction with a, um, a total solar eclipse. But like, even when I'm feeling bad, Coming in on Wednesday, you guys make my life better. Uh, last week, I loved having Arden on. Um, and I'm glad that we didn't have to rehash a lot of the same issues this week, um, but we will. And coming up soon, um, Jimmy's going to be on here with me as well because we're also going to be heading into an election year, an election season. And that means that we're going to be covering a lot more political stuff uh in greater detail in the meantime please even if you're a misanthrope you can still value humans and even if you're a nihilist you can still smile and even if you don't know anything about science you can still be a skeptic and say hey if you want to tell me something about science please do so in a way i can understand and if i can't understand it i'm not going to hold a position on this issue because I'd rather say I don't know than pretend I do and be wrong. See you next week. Bye-bye. This is Prickface McDoobagdoob signing off. Thank you to Emery King. I'm sorry we didn't get your super chat. Uh, I'm not comfortable with this discussion of armadillos without Ben. If you know, you know. I don't know, but thank you anyway. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.